Oh, like, like that. that. Yeah. For the AF. <laughs> how, I mean, MR fans. How there? many? Yeah, MSR, Sorry, I'm distracting MSR, you right now with the sound of yummy bourbon. <laughs> That's so good. ASMR, right? ASMR. This could be the intro sound to Welcome to Oil and Whiskey with your host, Josh. He's amazing. <laughs> That's the first time we've had a celebrity liner. Yeah. That's really good. We should do that more often. Um, hey, everybody. Welcome to Oil and Whiskey. Get ready for some talk about cars. Lowered, slammed. All right, this went bad. <laughs> Probably bad. One more time. All kinds of cuts. One more time. Keep going. <laughs> couple more bourbons and we'll be ready to get the intro for oil and whiskey guys thanks for listening <laughs> nice <laughs> Welcome to Oil & Whiskey, an Ironclad Original. I am Josh Henning. I'm Phil Gerber. I'm Jeremy Gerber. Welcome to Oil & Whiskey, an Ironclad Original. Today's guest is TV host and car and motorcycle designer, Brian Fuller. In person, already making drinks. Yes, sir. Bring it. <laughs> Brian Fuller is the owner of Fuller Moto out of Tucker, Georgia. Fuller Moto is a full-service custom automotive and motorcycle builder. They offer paint, upholstery, metal fabrication, CAD, and 3D printing services. In addition to fabrication services, Fuller Moto also hosts workshops. Brian is also the co-host of the car show Car Fix that airs on Motor Trend TV. He and co- Ugh, man, there's a lot of Ooh. shit here. <laughs> he and get co- too long of a resume. <laughs> yeah. He and co-host Jeremy Bumpus provide a special how-to look in anything from modifications to full-on concept builds. You can watch Season 10 on YouTube or Amazon Prime. Brian is also one of the hosts of Caffeine and Octane, alongside world champion motorcycle drag racer Ricky Gadsden and automotive historian Skip Smith. Ricky! And it keeps going. Good grief. Yeah, this is the longest one we've had. I know. This, well, is, yeah. this is too much. Run out of time before we get through the intro. <laughs> They've got to give him time to make the drinks. He's got, he's got, so fine. He's got books. <laughs> yeah. His books, Full Bore Welding and Full Bore Sheet Metal, provide a look <clears throat> into welding and sheet metal fabrication from the perspective of guys shop from the Good grief. And you're just, I know. your tongue's twisted today. No, that's, that's just too much. That's why we got that editing. Much. That's fine. Yeah. We can't do it in one shot. This is the TV star. He's I know the that's one what that can hit it. He should, read, he should have read this. Yeah, I don't do radio or print. <laughs> His books, Full Bore Welding and Full Bore Sheet Metal, provide a look into welding and sheet metal fabrication from the perspective of shop guys for <laughs> shop guys. You can learn more about Brian and Fuller Moto by visiting fullermoto.com or on Instagram at fullermoto. Brian Fuller. And all of your accomplishments, welcome <laughs> to Oil and Whiskey. And we put you right to work. This is the first guest that's actually... We're going to have to add cocktail... Uh, connoisseur? Yeah. Connoisseur. Whiskey maker. connoisseur. Well, you had me Craft at cocktail, cocktail fabricator. Creator. I was torn between, am I more excited about the whiskey or am I more excited about the oil? Mm. It was back and forth. What did it end up being? Have you both. decided yet? Yeah, both. both. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And actually, as much as I've, you know, I guess it doesn't matter, as much as I've fucking worked in the last four years... You know, COVID just turned the lights on for a lot of people. You guys are a big company. You know, we were we were able to kind of stay away from each other and yeah. work a little more undercover because we just have a such small operation. It turned the lights literally turned the lights off for <clears> us, <throat> as in like they shut. Yeah, they turned the they off. turned the lights out yeah. on us. Man, that's brutal. Yeah, yeah we so we pretty much hit out. Don't tell anybody. We just kept working. Yeah, we didn't do that either. There's yeah. no way we did that. Yeah, there's absolutely no way that <laughs> yeah. we, no, we hit employees. Well, I'll say I'm kidding. We didn't really <laughs> yeah. do that either. I'm just bullshitting. I think it's statute of limitations. True. We're good now. Yeah, you can't yeah. throw it. I don't know. They can probably yeah. figure out a way. So what do you make? Tell us, everybody, about what you're making for us right now. Oh, I am excited. So um, <laughs> I am making an old-fashioned. And those of you that know old-fashions know it's kind of the classic drink. But every time you go to the bar... For whatever reason, they don't take their craft seriously and they screw the old fashioned up. Yep. Am I right? It's yes. one of the yeah. most commonly butchered cocktails. Yes. For being something that has like three ingredients. Yeah. Well, generally, Throw when you're, at, sugar in when there, you're someplace like that doesn't have a, the, the greatest bourbon selection, your go to is like, well, all right, we'll just make me an old fashioned, you know? And that's generally when it's the worst. Like, it, absolutely. Hotel bar, you're traveling, you're somewhere, you go, and even nice restaurants sometimes you go to and it's, a destroyed it you're right it's a destroyed cocktail and i think it really falls into uh craftsmanship and i'm having trouble like making this drink in front of you and you know talking about craftsmanship <laughs> and craftsmanship <laughs> of a cocktail and holding this microphone up in my face all at the same time but 
you know, in this world, and one of the things I like about it is that you have to follow the rules when you build shit or it's just going to be fucked up or it's not going to work. Yep. And an old fashioned is one of those drinks that you've got to follow the rules. You've got to do it right. You've got to use this big cube. And if you don't, it's going to suck every time. Not much room I for freestyle. That, no. Yeah, I, I feel like craft, like classic cocktails are more like traditional hot rods. You just don't fuck with it. You know? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Keep do it, it traditional. Exactly. You can do little minor adjustments. Sure. The reason but, it's been famous for years and decades it's because it's good. It's because it's good. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Put a good so, bourbon in there. The key is what you you're wanting like 30, 40 shakes of the bitters. <coughs> you just want to go <laughs> half and bottle just, and dash it out, right? <laughs> and you want to fill the glass at least three quarters of the way up with various fruits and muddle <laughs> them, muddle them <laughs> along with a you know probably a cup of sugar. <laughs> Did I tell the story about the one time uh, me and Zach were in that? That little bar in Barrington, downtown Barrington, that was like on the corner. Um, and Shirley's? The, no. The Doodle? No. <laughs> I forget, it, right in the main downtown. But the lady says uh, she's going to create, she's going to give us the, this is <clears throat> a true old fashioned that is made from the original recipe. It is a classic old fashioned. Nobody makes an old fashioned like she does. Handed down from grandma. Yeah. Who grandpa handed it down, great grandpa handed it to her. You know what the first ingredient she reached for was? What? Take a guess. Brandy. Sprite. Oh, <laughs> no. When, was, when did they come out with Sprite? Sprite? When was no. Sprite? In the, in the 40s, oh. yeah. I think Sprite, Sprite was, was in the 40s. It came Oops. about from the Prohibition. They had to they had to come up with Sprite to be able to make I remember, yeah. I remember oh. hearing something about yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, it's, that's it's horrible. In all your old cocktail books for yeah. see. Sprite. I remember Al Capone sitting around it's sipping Sprites. <laughs> God, that is horrible. It'd yeah. Sear a mess if they don't have it. I guess. Yeah. Well... You know, I live in Atlanta and, uh, you know, the home of Coca-Cola. <clears throat> so I've been saying recently, and I've, for the record, kids, I don't advocate for you doing cocaine. I've never done cocaine. So alcohol is a drug. Be careful with whiskey. It can lead to plenty of problems that we've all experienced here that are adults, I'm sure. But <clears throat> um, I want to make old-fashioned uh, Coca-Cola with Coke. Because I'm just curious. Because you know, back in the day, they had cocaine in it. That's what it. That's what it was made with. Yeah. And what does that taste like? And I'm so curious again because I've yeah. never actually tried it. I wonder if it's in a like a performance enhancer. Do you feel, do you feel like it would? It's got to be. be. I wonder if be, it smells the same. I'm just thinking of it. It would be an interesting. <laughs> it would be an interesting line when you were pulled over. Like, oh no, actually, I've, I've I'm recreating Coca-Cola. <laughs> I just had a few yeah. colas, officer. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's at me and Escobar here. Yeah, I can only buy it by the key, and that's. I mean. It, yeah. It's fine. Yeah. It's like the Mexican version made with pure cane sugar. Yeah. I want to hop back. There's I a think bar named The Doodle in Barrington. Yeah, yeah Yankee, really? Yankee, Yankee Doodle. Doodle. Yankee Doodle. Okay. You've never been there? No, never been that's there. It's a cool little place. Really? Is that the one that's on the corner, the old old one? No, it's like back it's uh, by the train station. <laughs> little tiny the wedges, place. Shirley's. They've got good bourbons. Like, they've got Weller and stuff hmm. on the shelf there. Yankee Doodle. Mm -hmm. Downtown Barrington. Uh, all right, I'm trying to get these cocktails done. That could ruin right? a cocktail. Is yes, Wisconsin. Mm. Oh, put the brandy in it. Brandy, old fashioned, or when you go to any up north bar and they just have like a clear ketchup bottle full of the mix, oh, and it's just that squirted into a uh, a glass and then a little splash of bourbon. Is a brandy old fashioned any good? It's not bad. It's not. If you get, it, you just don't order it sweet. That's the thing that if you're a Wisconsin native, that's kind of a flex. If you walk into like a supper club or something. You go up there, you get yourself some white fish, you know, the fish fry, whatever, and then yeah, order yourself up. Yeah, and on top of that, once you throw a, I'll do a brandy old fashioned, eh? And you know, make it, <laughs> uh, and then you look at it, and you like, make it uh, sweet, eh? Oh, hey, <laughs> you know? that's and sweet, like, yeah. that's the flex, huh? Oh yeah, sweet. Just don't There's, get it sweet, right? What about up there in the UP? Oh, oh, they oh. love it up there. Them, them up guys there. up there. <laughs> so we just had Diener here this weekend. Oh yeah, hey Diener. <laughs> Diener. Who's Diener? Good old yeah. Diener used to run the plasma machine down here for a while oh, until really? he went back up north there in Iron Mountain. <laughs> Mo Mountain? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> down near Canada up there. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. Way up north. Yeah, I always wondered when I was young. I grew up in East <clears throat> Texas, and, you know, when I moved north, I'm like, why are these people up north talking like a Texas redneck? You know, Ooh. I mean, hey, man, what you got in my name? And I'm like, you're not from the south. <laughs> I mean, what, what what part of East Texas? Like Waco East or like, no, like Waco, like Shreveport, definitely, Louisiana East. Definitely not Waco. It's the Louisiana crazy 
you know, coon ass shit. Okay. What yep. part of Michigan was this like Michigan proper over on the other side of the lake or is this UP that you're picking up on this accent? Oh, up there. I just, I got a good buddy. You know, I have to give my Mark Prosser shout out because if I don't, then, you know, he'll like, did you tell him about me? <laughs> Lord. Is that so, fun? all right, if we're, where are you at on the oh, map? Oh, yeah, shit. I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm just, again, I just, my, one of my best friends talks, makes fun of them all the time. So that's about what I know. I had a short stint that I went to school in Michigan, like central Michigan, um, up near, like a little north of Grand Rapids. And the reason that they talk that way, I think I shared this with you before, they truly believe that their geographic location is just south of Tennessee. It's everybody's got Confederate flags. And I was told that, I man, it's country, country state of mind, man, southern state of mind. In Michigan. Yeah. Go like 30 minutes north, you're out of the fucking country. Dude, you're in Canada. <laughs> yeah. It's, you, are, you can't get any further north. Yeah, and then right. like, do you just cross over and then you turn into the, you know, Canadian Canuck language? I don't know I what mean, happens. Know. You just start taking slap shots and eating Timmy Horton's donuts <laughs> once you get up there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've heard of a slap shot, but I have no idea what a Timmy Norton is. <laughs> Timmy Horton's Donuts. So. Ah. Yeah. yeah, we have Dunkin's. Yeah. <laughs> so do we. Dunkin' Donuts of the Great White North. Yeah. I'm excited right, guys, to get this yeah, thing around. Hopefully, this is going to turn uh, out so well. Did you so wash your hands before? It, I did. <laughs> it's bourbon. You can't. So where did this... It's all it. bourbon. Where did this the recipe Cheers. come from? Cheers. Man. Woohoo! All right. This is quite the treat. screw this up. Quite the treat. Mm. That's pretty good. Yeah, very that good. Is. Nicely done. Yeah. Yeah. So Nicely where did the done. recipe come from? So I have a good buddy, uh, Andy <clears throat> Minchin, who's an Atlanta area kind of mixologist. <clears throat> and Paige and I, my wife, took a uh, bartending class that he had for Valentine's Day a few years ago. And uh, we mixed up like four drinks. And learning to make an old-fashioned was kind of like the one that really came out that, you know, unfortunately for me, just stuck like oh my god i love these old fashioned it's like mother's milk and uh you know the your mom's an alcoholic oh no yeah unfortunately i think i got all my mom's alcoholism but anyway uh it coincided with uh a bourbon sponsorship when we did our jekyll uh, event rebel yell was sponsoring kind of bike builders back then they were promoting cool. through the through that group and so we uh, got him to sponsor Jekyll. Well, they managed to send 55 cases of bourbon late. Most all of it showed up late. And That's so unfortunate. I was left with, with a lot of Rebel Yell. Now that's <laughs> six liters per case. And I tell you, man, it was years. It was literally like I had it home. I had, I gave it to friends. We had parties. The kids I mean, are walking around drinking it when they're thirsty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm just trying to finish this shit off so I can move on, you know. And uh, every time I turn around, there's like a camping box stuck in the back of a container. <laughs> Jesus, there's another case. <laughs> oh my god, my poor liver. <laughs> this is good though. It is it's got really a good, good. mouthfeel. Mm. I've always wanted to do something like that, dude. Like. A cocktail class with a you know, mixologist. Of, it's one of those things I think we talked about it a little bit. You, you get a lot of respect mm -hmm. for them. You know, the craftsmanship of it. Yeah. In today's day and age, you watch somebody who really knows what they're doing. Yep. It's pretty damn cool. Yeah, there's a lot of mystery behind it too and all the little small things. Like you said, some of it might be for showmanship, some of it yeah. not. I mean, we learned, I mean, from the absinthe uh, yeah. trick deal and the, that, that speakeasy in Louisville. Yep. It was like always That's a priceless a, knowledge right there. Yeah. That's, so, and people look at me now when I do that and I I take credit for it, obviously. Of course. But they really think you know what you're doing. Yeah. And so then it's you, a huge flex. Yeah. But it, it does change everything. Because, I mean, it was a struggle to, like... <clears throat> What's this move? Well, gosh. the absinthe rinse, usually, you know, you rinse the glass, whatever, and you pour But the problem was it was still so always overpowering and stuff. So that you burn it. Sets the, it on fire? You burn it off, yeah. yeah. And uh, so you still got the aroma, but you don't have any of that liquid that overpowers the drink and stuff. It was uh, crazy. Muchos buenos. Well, hopefully you guys can post this uh, <clears throat> recipe. So kind of the idea <clears throat> is we use typically pretty close to 100 proof. <clears throat> so I did some sampling with Andy the other day, which was fun. I went over to his, to his bar, and it's a big kind of wrought iron steel bar. Me and a couple of my guys built. It's got uh, silicon bronze welding all around it. It's got a 
gas mask logo in the center that's lit up, which is pretty fun. And uh, anyway, we went through like all the, all the different combinations and the 80 proof, if you use kind of a lesser proof at the beginning of the drink, you almost think it's better. It's a little more smooth. It's easier to go down. But then once you get, you know, as you start to melt, the ice starts to melt, everything starts to settle into the drink. When you get to the end, the hundred is actually, down. if you get closer to a hundred, it's actually sure. a lot better drink at the end. That's a, that's good. <clears throat> I've honestly never, I've overlooked the proof when making cocktails. Never thought about that. But like initially you taste that hits you, you get a little burn on it, which I like. I like like a, a spirit forward cocktail, as they say. <laughs> yeah, I like you that. Taste your spirit way. forward. Yeah, like, yeah right. You but, <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure as that gets a little diluted, it's on the money. So go ahead, go through the recipe. Tell, tell me what everybody so, works. Hunter proof. Hunter proof. So that's a good one. Obviously, the the big deal, you know, you know right off the bat, if somebody gives you an old fashioned and they didn't give you a big rock of ice, it's it's over. Like it's just not gonna happen. There's too much water. You know, like that you can't make a good old fashioned, in my opinion. With crushed ice. Without with crushed ice. Not gonna happen. So that's the the next big thing. Um bitters, what we're using, um, so we're using two and a half ounces of uh today we're using elijah craig small batch and um we're doing two and a half you can do two two to two and a half is really you know kind of the legit uh recipe for that and then we're using two different bitters we're using an orange bitters <clears throat> and we're using a um i'm gonna mess up the name it's aromatic angostura aromatic a angostura bitters. aromatic yep so we're using aromatic so i'm doing four dashes of each and and you can tap you know you can use eight of one and whatever it doesn't matter but to really do it legit i do half and half and then you use a little bit of an orange peel and i was crushing it as one of the things i went over with andy when i was down there and i was just like pummeling this thing and it's not to say that it was bad you know um there's a mash uh i think it's called a, a mash drink uh, or a bash that's kind of coming around right now. It's almost an old fashioned mixed with tonic. Berman Smash or something like yeah, that? Yeah, Berman, yeah Berman. Smash. That's yeah. it. Smash. Yeah. Really tasty. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, like- yeah, I smashed the shit out of it. <laughs> and Andy's like, yeah, you don't need that. You just cut it, try to just get the peel because you just want that little bit of bitter that's coming off of the, the edge of the peel. You don't need all the center. You don't need the sweet. You don't need any of that shit. You just need the very edge. Squeeze it in there. And then take a little bit of lemon, and the lemon really kind of takes the edge off. I thought it would make it lemony taste, but it just kind of takes the edge off and makes it a little more smooth. Hmm. So I think all the all, I think it's good. And then what about agave? Oh, and then agave. Verse, uh, yeah, quarter syrup. ounce. Quarter ounce of agave. It's, you know, you can use simple sugar and honey, you know, if you're... I'm but. surprised at the <clears throat> amount of bitters um, and what it tastes like. I think, it, I'll bet you it's the 100 proof that helps Kills out it. with that. So you go, that like I was talking about the Sprite, shortly after that lady poured Sprite in there, it's like you take the cap off the beers, basically, and just... Right. Or you see somebody in there looking at you, and they're like, eight, <laughs> nine, ten, eleven. You can smell it even before she yeah. gives it to you, and as soon as, it's just literally undrinkable. But the or, I think the orange bitters along with it probably cut some of that, and then, like you said, the 100 proof. It's, yeah, no bullshit. It's a really good, really good cocktail. Thank well you. Done. I'm excited about it. Man, we need cheers. To, we need to have Woo. more guests that come on and make us yeah, cocktails. Mm. You're going to be able to do this all night and keep talking, right? Hell yeah, let's do this. <laughs> so, so with that, I was, I was worried about going two hours until I had two sips of bourbon. And now I'm like, all right, we can go all night. <laughs> go. That's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Three, four hours later, you know. The, uh, yeah, we were worried about doing it too until uh, Courtney drank us under the table in the, with the tequila and turned us onto that. That tequila shit will keep, like, you don't get tired on it. <clears throat> That's an upper. Yeah. My wife and I um, have got to a point, I, I think we're past it now, but 10 years ago we were a little more hot-headed and, you know, young kid and yada, yada. We decided we cannot have tequila together. We One of us can have tequila, but yeah. not both, because the shit just turned into like, oh, yeah? You think you're so blah, 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 blah. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, you don't know. I mean, like, it just. Yeah. And the, That's just the Alabama coming out of you because you've been over there to Barbara's a bunch. Yeah, it'll happen. Yeah. You can't, yeah. Couples can't drink together in Alabama. <clears throat> no. I'm in Georgia right next Somebody to Alabama. Somebody getting their ass whooped. Yeah. Yeah, that trailer's only so wide. She you know? usually ends up saying something. You can only run so far. <laughs> 
Uh, so tell you've been working on this new shop and that thing's looking awesome. Tell us about the Thank shop. Thank you. Yeah. Shop's going great. We're, uh, just coming up on kind of out of the blue realize it's been 20 years, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, so we've got a great team of guys. It's, uh, really young at this point. So it feels like a fraternity house. I mean, the weekends are really pretty cool. You know, you come in there and you've got 21 year old Ezra and they're working on his DeLorean, putting a roof rack on made out of custom aluminum. That's and then cool. Derek's, you know, building the world's greatest race bike. And, you know, Wes is jacking up a four wheel drive car. You know, I'm in there trying to, you know, clean up everybody's mess and keep the <laughs> shit organized and yelling at people because they, you know, won't clean their crap up. And then at some point, you know, if I can get it clean enough then I can actually get some work done. Um, what kind of, what's the, <clears throat> what's the square footage on that? Uh, we're up to about 17, 18,000 square feet. That's a That's huge big operation, change. I, Cause I remember going to your old shop. Oh yeah. Right. Um, like on the loading docks there. <clears throat> yep. And, uh, this was years and years ago, came there and did a, uh, Ron Covell class, me and oh, Larry yeah. Pierce. Oh, that's right. Wow, yeah. that's funny. I forgot you were on that. Was, ben was still working there hey, for you. Show, right? Ben was the one show, that came from Show Detroit. me on the doll where he touched Bender. you. Uh, what did you say? <laughs> I said, show me on the doll where he touched you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a naughty, naughty spot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we, so I remember that's a backstory I don't know about. <laughs> wow. That shop was awesome, but all the thing that was going through my head, I mean, it was a smaller shop. You had it sectioned up. It was It was awesome. Use of space and organize it's funky, stuff. yeah. It was but really that funky, was real, cool. real, real like short after you had just built that Thundertaker, yeah. And I'm like, I'm looking at it, I'm like, it wasn't built in here. There's no, there's yeah. no, how did you get it in there? Well, we had to, you know, we had a special room just for the Thundertaker, and then we literally had to go dolly it just to get it out of there. You know, we had to jack the thing around just to get it out because that thing was what 23, 24 foot long. It was 22 feet. This is the, the hearse that we built and turned it into a basically a silver white interior limo and uh four years of work insane you know like up until our tesla conversion that we're doing right now is probably the hardest oh. hardest thing that we ever built you know there's five doors the world's largest sunroof we put three sunroofs together privacy screen with two tvs that came up and down dual you know air ride stainless steel firewall stainless under the gas tank in the rear raise the fins four inches. I mean, it was just ridiculous. I mean, I mean, it's a big ass clock. Wow. That hurts. He's just blocking down the side. Jesus. Man. Yeah. What, dude. Did somebody commission you to do that? Yeah. Yeah. What, what was the, what was that initial he, conversation? Like? <laughs> uh, Philip was awesome. He, I met with him and he, I said, he's like, had this really just wanted a hearse. He was like a big kid that had a lot of money that wanted a hearse, you know? Hmm. And, uh, and I sent him two renderings and one was basically Ghostbusters semi flat black. And I was like, all right, we can, you know, do this car and, you know, basically make it run. We can just do some epoxy black on the thing and whatever you can drive the kids around and, or we can do this one, which was what it ended up. And you're going to have a $50,000 Chrome bill. And that was like 10 years ago. And actually that was pretty accurate estimation of the job project because it was a $50,000 Chrome bill. Looks like it. I mean, yeah. by today's standards, inflation, it's a hundred thousand bucks. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. That sounds about right. <laughs> yep. It was, it was a uh, very hard, you know, like I feel like in all these hard projects, maybe you do or don't have the same experience, but I feel like, you know, almost every one of these really hard ones, you lose somebody cause it just, it's like a casualty of war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> like the better the project is and the more no notorious and the harder and the more groundbreaking, the more brutal that it is, the more like at some point somebody breaks. Yeah, you know you made something like phenomenal if somebody exits the entire hot rod industry after they're done building it. Yeah. It, yep. it, because they left it all on the field at that yep. point. They yep. go become an accountant. Yep. Yeah. Just <clears throat> yep. Ran. Well, not to derail. So uh, tell us about the new shop. So oh. I, I, that shop was awesome. I just know the size limitations and stuff. You were doing... Still doing cars, but you're doing way more motorcycles at that point in that shop, right? Yeah, the motorcycle industry was uh, hotter back then. Um, you know, we're still doing a bike here and there, but it's, you know, the market's just changed. I mean, at the end of the day, like, there are less motorcyclists. I think that's going to change. I, I really do believe that with the the e-bikes that have come out, 
um, the, the scooters that came around, you know, like all of these kind of intro gateway drugs to someone on two wheels. Yep. You know, I really do believe that, um, and there is a movement, you know, there's a good movement of, of guys that are just, they're not building super high end stuff, but they're in their garage they're taking the, the mirrors off their bike and they're putting the blinkers on and they're making a little cafe tail for it. And there's a good, you know, there's a good American worldwide scene for that happening, you know, and that gives me happiness. The big tire backer <clears throat> thing still rolling. That's there's people making lots of big fiberglass bags and 26s <clears throat> and 28s. Have you, so, so uh, I forgot, ah, oh, damn it, his name slipped me right now, but um, one of the guys that makes the neck conversion for those, so supposedly they actually steer, which I've never ridden one, so I don't really know, but um, I was like, man, how many of these can there really be? You know what I mean? And he said something crazy, like, I've sold 350 of them in the last year or something ridiculous, maybe two years, I mean, that means they were they were pushing, you know. Well, I mean, over the last five years, there could have been six hundred of them built. I don't I would know. A say, thousand? I, don't I don't know, know. what kind of numbers Affliction did on jeans, but I would say it's that kind of a for every one. five <laughs> Affliction jeans, there would be one of those big tire baggers, wouldn't you? I feel like you're on the wrong vehicle. That that's a, like a big bear chopper. That's the, you know, that era. The two thousand version. Yeah. yeah that, what is it, what's that tire? It's like, like a three hundred or two eighty three. Yeah. Three hundred. Uh, right. If you think it's like a damn Mickey you've been Thompson. To bike week. There's a drag slick on the back of it. They've no, they've moved into yeah, the they moved into the big wheel bagger yeah. now. They, it's every yeah, twenty feet a, during Daytona. I don't, what kind I don't of bike does Daytona Kenny anymore. Davis have? I would assume it'd be a big tire bagger. I, He's got the jeans for it. Yeah, that's where I was going. I can't wait for that text message. Yeah, but. Anyway, like you said, that for for so long, uh, the biker thing. I mean, there were so many different styles, different genres. It was so big, so hot. But that was like a fucking light switch. I know. In two thousand eight, I mean. Well, you know what it was. The economy. Mm, Well, that was part of it, but you know, there were these couple of you know, dad and a brother, dad and a son, who, you know, used to be like when biker build off came out, you know. You got Indian Larry. He's got freaking like tattoos across his neck in reverse. And he's, you know, New York crazy choppers, metal flake, like twisted front deal. You know, Jesse James comes out with monster, you know, um, what am I? Uh, uh, Monster. Oh, what was the bike? Motorcycle, motorcycle Mania. Mania. Yeah. 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 Hanging dude. out with Kid Rock. Like, yeah, yeah dude. fucking awesome, dude. You get to hang out with Kid Rock. Sweet. You know, we're. <laughs> I mean, I thought the shit was bad. It was like, awesome. I'm like, oh shit, yeah, dude! It was, the, it was. But the everybody, shit. everybody wanted to emulate. Do that. I know. Everybody <laughs> wanted to emulate that. It didn't matter what you were—a banker, a doctor, and something. That's why you had American Iron Horse and Big Dog had dealership set up everywhere and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah. When, when the fucking economy crashed, I mean, that was well, the first there was thing the economy. Yeah, yeah, that is true. The economy crashed, but the other thing that happened were some people. I don't want to really mention who they were. Some people in the, don't be scared. Say it. Some people made the shit not look cool anymore. Like it was. When you pulled up on a bike like that, you were a fucking badass. You were a sick, crazy artist on this Harley. He's like, and this dude they look over next to you and like, holy shit, man, this guy's got like chains and boots and tats and, and I a horse head holy for a tank. Shit. Dude, I don't know who yeah. you're talking about because I, I rolled up to some cruise night. I thought I was fucking badass. I mean, my bike, it was really stretched out. It was like a F. Uh, it was like F-16 fighters. Is that what they call those? Oh, had the bullets. The tail fins on the side. Yeah, the tail fins was all <laughs> silver. It had, you know, it was pretty cool. It had a little, fed machine it had little wings on the back. Like, yeah. so that was, yeah. That So that's not, so you mean like, those were cool, right? But, that, those. Yeah, you're on the right track. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, you put a rake on the back fender. I mean, yeah. Well, I, cut it, I, like, I cut it with my what big, a great idea. My big cutoff. I used to just hold them up and I'd eyeball them and I'd just kind of take that big cutoff. Exactly. Wheel, give yeah. them a peek. You yeah. Know? I remember throw fifty seven Chevy fins on it, make it a three wheeler. Mm. Yeah, you great idea. That. Great That's, idea. Yeah. It's a it's the funnest ride <laughs> I've ever had in my life. <laughs> I remember watching uh, some of the early biker bill offs and that stuff, and they would they had the electric cutoff wheel. And in the hot rod industry in California, where I learned, people didn't use that. People didn't use no. that. No, no, we nobody didn't. would use air that. powered only. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you only use air power. Right. And uh, and I was like, God, these hacks! Like, what are they doing? <laughs> And then all of a sudden, I don't know, at some point, I was like, I should just try it. And so I took a, like a six, seven inch, you know, 
cut off wheel, put it on an electric grinder. I'm like, this is amazing. Oh my God. And now like, oh, I'll, I will you, like electric cut off wheel, 7,000 RPM. You can fucking cut, cut everything. You can cut the shit out of some stuff. It's awesome. I will say I, what you need to get, I've got a three M uh, six inch pneumatic cut off wheel. It's the nastiest tool really in, in existence. Nice. Because you, uh, there's cut nothing worse. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, there's nothing worse than watching a guy with a Harbor freight right angle grinder with an with a cutoff wheel arbor on it, tr- cutting through like a piece of two inch thick steel. Yeah, <laughs> all day, yeah. all day, like back just, and forth, back and like, forth. Wh- how do you have the fucking patience for that? You know, there's probably somebody who's like a YouTube star, and and all they do is just sit there with a cutoff wheel like for hours on end, and they, you know, some, you know, I hate to say corporate guys, but there's some corporate guys watching, like they got it on their monitor while they're working. And like, yeah, man, this guy just sits there with a cutoff wheel on thick steel all day. It's <laughs> amazing. I love it. I just, I can't, I don't know what it is. I just watch him. What do you think? I mean, I know all that stuff with the you know, various biker builders and stuff you know, had its own impact on that, uh, that hobby. But what do you think really was the main factor in that bikes just coming to a screeching halt? Because it was, I, no, I there do. was nothing was bigger. Overnight. Then I do. Believe, I honestly do believe like the reason you do this shit is that, you know, you like to pull up and, you know, it's a it's a tangent going to, you know, the electric conversation, because, you know, when you roll through, I, I live in a neighborhood in Atlanta, which is, uh, you know, a lot of doctors, a lot of lawyers, lots of Teslas, lots of, you know, uh, Porsches and so badass you know, hardcore men. Right. Yeah. Exactly. On the weekends. And so, you know, and I'm the retard, my poor wife, you know, I pull up, <laughs> you know, and the shit all over the place. And, you know, they're Are partially. Are you making those noises or is that the car? That's the car. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. the car. Uh, excuse me, Brian. I think your car is making some weird noises. <laughs> Sounds like it's falling apart. Shut dry, up, Brian. Dry clutch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, like the electric, you know, engine became cool to the masses not to us of course but um so you don't want to pull up on a a bike and people think that you're you know you want to like pull up in something you work your fucking ass off on and have people go dude that's badass man that's cool and you know i think it's coming around it's changed but yeah for a minute there it was like oh you're like those guys i'm like no i'm not like those guys everybody wants to be an outlaw until everybody's an outlaw and nobody wants to until it's, time, like until it's time to do outlaw until shit. It's time to do outlaw shit. But <laughs> well, I think once they realize you're not really an outlaw. Oh yeah, you're yeah. just a pirate. You're dressing up like a pirate on the weekend. <laughs> Arr. Arr. <laughs> <laughs> Got my tassels. Oh uh, yeah, that's yeah, that was sequence the, and stitching and. Well, it was, it was also the era of the like the sucker punch. Sally's was doing those like you could kind of <clears> put yourself yeah. together a pretty cool kit. Yep, bobbers Flying were hot or whatever. Yeah. Dar in Oklahoma City. I remember. Or, we're looking at all those wanting ones so, so much bad. Shit. Yeah. yeah. They're fun. I mean, you know, like I've, I've brought about, you know, um, just circle it back to 20 years. So the Texas T was the very first motorcycle I built. <clears throat> and I was in a little 600 square foot um, blacksmith shop. My brother-in-law kind of brought me to Atlanta. I was like, hey, man, I got a little place you can work. The guy owes me a favor. And so I cleared out this little window of a spot you know, painted it all, like painted all the tables, painted all the benches because I wanted to really, you know, establish, even though this is a very small beginning, like, you know, I run a clean, organized, you know, like kind of shop for multiple reasons. And uh, so I bought it back about a year ago. <clears throat> and so I'm taking it to the handbuilt show in Austin this coming weekend. And it'll be fun to like take a 2000s chopper with the two 80 rear tire and you know it's nine feet long and you know i didn't know i was a car guy yeah. the fuck did i know you know like uh, yeah i rode dirt bikes and shit but i never had i never owned a street bike in my life so uh it's fun now i'm gonna go take take it to austin hang out with all the hipsters and, that's it that's the bike yep <clears throat> so did you come from car building bike building i mean where did Where'd you cut your teeth? Where'd you get started? What got you interested in just where'd you things, come from? Man? Th- things, things with wheels and tires and motors and um, you know I was uh, I was a BMX kid, so you know riding BMX around the neighborhood and we had one of those neighborhoods where you couldn't have reflectors and yeah. you couldn't have a kickstand. That's because you were cool. Yeah, that's the first thing you do is yeah. yard that yep. shit off. Yep, you got to take that shit off or your your 
you know. Yeah, I reckon you get your ass whooped for driving around with reflectors on yeah. your bike. Oh yeah. my god, <laughs> it, there should be some movie. I'm sure there's a movie out there, but is there a movie about that? I don't know. I took my son I, first bike. We took the training wheels and then we took the reflectors off and. My wife gave me a hard time. No one's going to see him of at course. night. I'm like, yeah, but nobody's going to beat his ass during the day. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of a good. I like it. Yeah, you know, I came home That's from good. work one day, and this was like, it, this was the greatest <clears throat> thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was like a rite of passage for a young boy. My son, by himself, he's got his bike laid on its side in the driveway, and he's got a screwdriver. He's like holding like this, taking the reflectors off the bike, nice. all on his own. Like, this nice. kid's going to be okay. Yes. <laughs> Cheers to that. <laughs> yes. You did good. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. That's a great story. My son <laughs> took my, I've got a 24 inch BMX um, that I rode quite a bit. And then I got, you know, old and I got an e-bike, which is also a BMX, a Zuz, which is built yeah. somewhere around here. Those things are awesome. They, they, at least they look awesome. Shit. They are How's awesome. Right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, my normal bike is not getting as many miles in hilly Atlanta. <clears throat> And so he's like, yeah, dad, I'm going to take the, uh, I'm going out with my buddies and some girls, you know, I want to take the BMX bike. I'm like, all right, but dude, that is probably the only fucking BMX bike in the country with fluid disc brakes. So do not lose my fucking bike. Do not lose. I don't, you know, like I'm very easy. Like I'm very easy about our shit. You know, do not lose my fucking BMX. I'm telling you, I'm going to be fucking pissed. He come, you know what I mean? Come back with the seat all the way down and the handlebars, handlebars push forward. forward. Dude, I was going to, I was, was going to say it. I am like, I do not want to remake the fucking bracketry and make new disc brakes. I'm going to be so mad. Did he bring it back in one piece? He did. I don't even care if it's in one piece. Just bring the fucking bike back. You know, break something I'm fine with. Don't get it stolen. Anyway. So BMX kid. Oh, yeah. BMX kid. So I was always customizing shit. I snuck out a lot. Hopefully my son doesn't listen to this. And, uh, you know, it was kind of in that scene. And I just, I remember being a kid and just like, man, if I could just cut things apart and re-weld them together into a different form, like how amazing this bike would be. But instead, I'm just going to take a rattle can and I'm going to spray paint it all black. And then I'm going to spray paint my clothes black because I'm going to sneak out tonight. <laughs> And go right around the neighborhood, you know. Um, but anyway, I went to college, did the college thing, got a pre-med degree. Pre-med? Just, yeah. Biology, chemistry, and just could not see myself going back to school anymore. I was burnt and got a sales job, and I was driving a Chop 50 Plymouth to a sales job. How'd with that the seats not even bolted down. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing, man? <laughs> you were Who wondering why I? you weren't selling anything, right? You're like, why is this not working out for you? <laughs> that was pre-internet, by the way. They, they gave you a phone book. Here's a phone book. Go sell chemicals. What, is, what year is this? What era? Oh, God. That was Roughly. probably 97, okay. 96. In where? Texas? East Texas, yep. <clears throat> I had a Caesar haircut, and he's like, mm. you know, we're just not. Did. Yep. We're not sure about the Caesar haircut, or we're not sure about your haircut. And I'm like, it's a Caesar. It's been around, like, <laughs> okay. since, since Caesar. Caesar. Right. <laughs> People wear this? I'm I like, mean, short. Like, <laughs> It's push forward. Yeah. I, I don't have a part on the side. It's got highlights, right? It's got highlights. I mean, I'll change the shell toes and the jinkos, but the, yeah. fucking, the, the Caesar's not going anywhere. I know. I'm like, you hired me from a restaurant. I'm like, I worked at Bennigan's. Like, what the? Uh, what did you expect? Like, I don't know. I, I never did sales. You know? I mean, that's awesome. Ninety-seven. Yeah. Switch yep. it up to some hill figures and case whistles. Oh, dude, oh yeah. What, yeah. A, what an era! And yeah. those were the days. So, uh, yeah, I had, so I, I quit the job and I called my mom and my mom's a school teacher. And I was like, look, I know it's kind of crazy, but I'm not going to chiropractic. I'm going to a tech school. I'm going to Wyo tech. I'm going to go learn about hot rodding. And I'm like, I'm going to pay for it myself. You know, you know, you're, you know, obviously I wouldn't ask you to do that after getting me through college. And, um, and she was like, we always thought you should do something with your hands. <laughs> And I'm like, so you talked me into going to med school? Like, it's anyway. kind of the same thing. Were yeah. you like, was it just the bikes and the thought of modifying the bikes that drove you to like seek out WyoTech? Or were you interested in hot rods? Were there hot rod magazines? Were you the kid that just had the hot rod magazine tucked in between oh, your yeah. med books and oh, stuff? Oh, yeah. Or? No, I, um, I had a Model A in high school. I drove a yellow chop top 327, okay. you know, shift kit. Uh, oh. car that I talked my dad into. I was in, I couldn't even drive yet in theory. So I'd dr circle, make circles in the neighborhood, listen to some white snake, you know, and mm. ZZ top. <clears throat> and uh, eventually, you know, when I got my license, I could actually leave the house. But um, 
yeah, no, I, my dad bought a Mustang when I was in middle school and I was kind of the, the gopher help him take shit apart and cool. whatever. And it was kind of a midlife crisis thing for my dad, but I was just completely hooked. Um, and our garage burned down when I was in high school and, uh, the model A burned to the ground and all of our tools and, you know, uh, reloading equipment is all pew, 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 three o'clock in the morning going crazy. That'd be cool. <clears throat> um, I'm out there in my underwear trying to hose down, keep the house from catching on fire. And, uh, I kind of got out of it going to college and then I met a buddy uh Juan Green who uh is still a friend today and um he just was into building things he was into bicycles and next thing you know I'm like I'm building my bicycle I'm like stripping thing putting CNC cranks on it and which led to me buying a, a 1950 Plymouth and <clears throat> uh, that was my first full ground up and then it just went you know at that point right, I was so fucking you're, backed you were hooked, hooked. Yeah. Where did you see WowTech ads? Was that magazine? Yeah, magazines. I'm trying to think if they had any other ads back then. Uh, mainly magazines, yeah. 97. You'd had, you'd had TNN, right? You would had some stuff on... Uh, yeah, I always remember it on T. It's WowTech. Yeah. yeah. It's always you might have had, that one think, dude. Just, yeah, they were probably at, yeah, they were probably advertising it back then. Yeah. I've always wondered, I mean... Things have changed so much in the last 20 years as far as advertising and kids in interested stuff, in it. Yeah. How did you find something you're like, well, that's not only what I want to <clears> do, <throat> that's a school that I can go to learn it, you know? Yeah, yeah, no doubt, man. God, it was so a long just time ago. packed up and, and we're going to WyoTech. I'm yeah. going to be a fucking hot rod builder. Yeah. The baddest yeah. around. I mean, I packed up and I moved. Um, I left Texas for the first time and I was terrified, which is fucking hilarious now looking back. But yeah, I was so worried about leaving. I'm like, this is my Texas. And they brainwash you there to you know, believe that there's no other state in the union. Yeah. That's its own country. You can't leave <clears throat> yeah. Texas. Yeah. You can't leave. I was like, what in the hell? It's fucking hot. I mean, yeah. Great people, great culture. Love it. You know what I mean? But damn, it's fucking hot down there. <laughs> um, so yeah, in a U-Haul, I got all my shit and I moved to, uh, went to Wyotech and it was like the first time in my life. I was actually like a really good student. You know, it was the weirdest thing to get you gave got, a shit about it. I got A's like, well, what in the hell? I like, I did my homework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you didn't have to study for it either, right? Not really. Yeah. I mean, you know, there was a lot of stuff that was basic hot rod. You had to go through a, like a core group. So I did paint and body, you know, and I've been painting, I painted my first car in middle school. So, I mean, I painted for a long time. So a lot of it was very ding dong. Um, but once you got to hot rod, then, you know, I learned chassis building and I learned some sheet metal fab, but mainly chassis building. Gordon Cosset was the, the chassis fab teacher there and he was awesome and very strict and really disciplined and really taught you craftsmanship and you know everything had to be um very very tight so that 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 was a great intro and, and a great starting point to my career who else was in class with you then oh man I, i'm sorry i'm gonna be a bad anybody that's anybody now you know prosser i met there he was an instructor and and um he was someone that i kept in touch with but i didn't really keep in touch with very many of my classmates unfortunately this was it, before vc tech then right when he, yep. he went yeah oh, wyo tech in that area i mean i'm guessing this is now you're probably close to like 2000 oh six seven okay that era of wyo tech, sorry like, 96 wow okay damn right. it showing my age yeah, 96 seven. The, sorry <clears throat> like late 90s into the early 2000s wyo tech really produced some Oh yeah, serious talent. I mean, it, like in this industry out. today, you look at a lot of these guys, and like Andy Leach, I think mm. he's a wild tech guy. Levi Green, wild tech guy. Chad Glasshagel, wild tech guy. John York out here, wild tech guy. At your wild tech guy. Yep. And then I don't know what year it was when they just said like, "Fuck it, we're not going to teach these kids anything useful anymore." Or maybe the kids just weren't useful anymore. But it, that that yeah, era, that era was they had like, a lot of problems they had uh they had some corruption and they were just pumping kids they were popping them in and you know not really educating them it started out you know like a lot of things started out good it got bought by a couple of companies that were corinthian was one of them that bought them and they were actually under a class action lawsuit you know they got shut down that. there was a big that was a big national story for a long time and it sucked i mean it was you know it took my you know something that launched me into a whole new life you know, like my life beforehand, you know, before deciding to do this was, 
you know, I was a B student. I was a B friend. I was a B athlete. I was a pretty much, I was a B in anything I did in my life. And I was afraid to go after the dream. You know what I mean? And once I decided that, you know, I'm going for the fucking dream. And once I decided to go for it, you know, the fear of failure promoted me and pushed me into, you know, like not giving a shit. You know what I mean? My wife, when we, we got together, we've been in Atlanta and I'm building the Texas tea and she's paying our rent and I don't have any money and there's no budget for the thing. And she's like, so what's your backup plan? I'm like, there's no backup plan. This is what I do. I'll yeah, eat cereal. Yeah. I'll leave, live in the fucking truck. I'll live in the shop. And I live to that motto today. I mean, I don't give a fuck. I mean, at the end of the day, I love to build shit, you know? Don't you wish there was somebody that would have recognized that talent, that mindset, like back in high school, like freshman year of high school? Everything was so geared, at least for us. You know, it's very geared. you're just going to, like, you're going to learn these skills. You're going to do good in math. You're going to do good in science. You're going to go to college. You're going to do business. Right. Go to because you've business. done all the grades, right. great. You're going to find nobody, a great job. Yeah, nobody it is nobody steered fun. anybody that way. I was saying, I, I went to, you know, you said you're a beast. I was like, that was a solid D. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> cracked into the C range. And the same thing with sport. D, C. On the uh, went to uh, Fair State University oh, really? and, uh, for a year. Not even, no, one semester. One semester was auto body class. So it was like, they had the same kind of programs as WyoTech, but they didn't have the hot rod portion of it. And instantly, like without even trying, the... the Level of applying myself stayed the same. Very little. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> so <laughs> very little. But somehow I was like, dude, A's. Easy. This is a piece of cake. And it was the it was the craziest experience to realize like all of a sudden I was I made it the only reason I got D's and C's in high school is because I found that like the people that get like B's and I copied their homework and shit. Yeah. And that worked really well. Now I'm that guy. I'm like, and it's so fucking easy. I'm like, this is the weirdest thing yep. ever yep. to do that. And I'm still not like really even trying, but it's just if people would have identified that they're, some people are just geared that way, you know, and that's what you can do and you can do it well yep. and steer people that that's what would make phenomenal Instead of plumbers. Just getting rid of shop class all well, together yeah, or any Phenomenal of, woodworkers you know, and phenomenal mechanics, but none of that. We don't have that anymore. Even exists. So how in this podcast, what happens when, you know, the bartender needs to make another cocktail? Oh, we just, you just, just start making just it. Yeah. Make. Yeah. All right. Do you want just, another or you want something different? Oh, absolutely. I'd take another. Yeah. I got to finish this one, but. Get you some training wheels for that. Do we have new cubes or do I? I think, I think we got two batches of cubes. Oh, another one's still in the box. So. Yeah. So while you're making that cocktail, yeah. and then we'll move on to something else. But why don't you get, uh, on. get, get rid of our kitty litter box? <laughs> <laughs> These are now in a, a bath of water. Uh, they just they've, they've glazed over, made them clear. So or, you're gonna uh, you're gonna stand there off the top layer. You're gonna tell me that ice cubes need to be chilled to not melt. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> you can't just leave them frozen. S- Hell of a you, concept. You can't just leave them sitting on a chair. <laughs> no, on a leather <laughs> chair. For 45 <laughs> minutes. So picky. Huh. So what were at WyoTech, what did they do? I'm always interested in this. What did they do as far as job placement uh, for you? Because I've spent probably close to 20 years um, here and before at my other place w- trying to reach out to every college oh, yeah. trade school in the world, try to find that person, you know, that was in job placement and think, Hey, put us at the top of the list. At least, you know, give us a minute. If any of your next, I mean, from McPherson to WyoTech to Lincoln tech, I mean, all these different places and could not even get an email response back. Wow. That's um, crazy. So what, in, in your experience then, did they say, Hey, we've got some places you can reach out to, or was it like, Hey, you got your diploma, go figure it out. Man, that is, uh, looking back, I know that I was compiling a list of potential shops that I wanted to go to. Who was on those lists at that time? Um, Who's at the top? Alan Johnson, SoCal Speed Shop was at the top. Um, You know, Boyd's was in the middle of breaking up during that. That would have been, like, right at the top, of course. And I I thought they had, um, I thought White Tech back in the day had a, kind of list of addresses and but one of the things I did that was unusual back then was I really wanted to make sure that people opened up the envelope so I drew a 50 Merc uh, chop top with flames on the side and I like hand wrote my address on there and then every single page you know from cover letter and resume and whatever 
had a drawing that I did on each page just to make sure that whoever opened it knew that, you know, there was some shit behind it. So you didn't just print out your credit hours. 40 and, hours of hot rod, 20 hours of chassis and fab. fold it yeah. up and put it in a Wyotech envelope and send it out like the 7,582 <laughs> kids that applied for jobs well, here. There's something, there's something to be yeah, said for that. I mean, honestly, because you know, yeah. we we see those and there is no personality anymore, to it. Right? And yeah. there is no, you know, there is no... It's a creative like, industry and you're showing yes, no creativity. No creativity whatsoever. If, my reason I was going that, so Mike Wagner, um, great employee that we've got, you know, he's a great assembly guy. He was, he, I think, I'm going to probably butcher this. I thought he went to UNO, University of Northern Ohio, I think. But regardless, met him at SEMA. He comes up. He was, you know, well put together. He's got his resume. And, man, that kid did not stop. He get the resume. We probably ran into him by happenstance four or five more times that week at SEMA. Hey, have you looked at my resume? Have you thought about it? Have you done any of this kind of stuff? I'm like, you know. And that stuck with me. And then we get back, he's emailing me. You know, I gave him a card and stuff like that. Hey, have you had a chance to look at it? And persistence. And honestly, after a while, it's kind of like, you know what? I mean, the the kid's persistent. God Let's damn, I'll just, I'll just hire you just, so you just leave me alone. Right? And it turned out to be fucking awesome. And you see that so many times with the persistence is generally a byproduct of of giving a shit and really wanting to try. When you We've gotten so many, how many times have we gotten applications, resumes, Call the guy right back. Hey, we could, you know, let's set up a time on Monday. You know, when you come in Monday, no problem. I can be there at three thirty. All right, great. Three thirty. Three thirty rolls around, doesn't show up. Or three fifteen, he calls and says, "Hey, sorry, something come up. Can we reschedule tomorrow? Or can we do this? Can we do that?" And it's the initiative part. Like it's very easy to tell. To, to your point, so you took the initiative to personalize. Oh, I like, like that. That's yeah. nice. For the AS. I mean, MR fans. How over? many? Yeah, MSR. Sorry, I'm distracting you right now Whatever with the sound is. of yummy bourbon. <laughs> That's so good. ASMR, right? ASMR. This could be the intro sound to Welcome to Oil and Whiskey with your host, Josh. He's amazing. <laughs> That's the first time we've had a celebrity liner. Yeah. That's really good. We should do that more often. Um, hey everybody, welcome to Oil and Whiskey. Get ready for some talk about cars. Lowered, slammed. All right, this went bad. <laughs> Probably bad one more time. All kinds of cuts. One more time. Keep going. <laughs> Couple more bourbons, and we'll be ready to get the intro for Oil and Whiskey, guys. Thanks for listening. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, but you Mercedes know, to the main stage. Mercedes. Uh, you know, back to my point. Like you said, you're putting that initiative <clears throat> in because you want to be noticed. You've got the mentality of. There's probably a bunch of other people that want this job. I've got to stand out, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show the, the care and the effort. You need like one more hand. You do, well, dude. I only, at that point, I was older. I had a college degree. My dad died when I was young. I mean, you know, there's nothing to fall back on. I mean, I had a good family. You know, my family would have taken me in at any minute. And like, hey, I'm, uh, you know, it didn't work, and I'm like screwed. You know, what do I do? I mean, obviously, I had family you know, that would have taken me in, but I mean, yeah, but failure wasn't an option. Failure wasn't an option. I didn't have shit. And you know, at the end of the day, this was the dream. And you know, once you go off down the dream path, then funny thing is you, you learn from successful people is that the fear of failure goes away. You know, once you realize that failure is not something to be feared. And I think our culture has, instilled this fear, feel, fear of failure into society. And it's a shame because we come from such a, a stock of like, you know, craftsmen, builders, people that went across the fucking ocean for three months, you know, to come to another, a better life. I mean, that's our, that's our DNA, you know what I mean? As a country. And we've ended up with this soft, you know, cushy, yeah. rich, you know, well, I think the definition of failure needs to be changed. It's the difference between failing because you didn't try and failing because you tried and learning from that experience and trying again. Exactly. Giving up. Yeah. You know, or never even trying because you're, you know, afraid of fail or, or, or you know, I mean, that'd be like you know, me saying I, I, I failed at never making it as an NBA player. I, ne I never tried, you know, and obviously, yeah. I mean, you can tell that I couldn't have done it. You never know. <laughs> Right. What what is it about you that would make you not a great NBA player? Uh probably my height, uh skill set. 
um, a, inability to play basketball. Mm. I, could, I, could con- <laughs> I could continue. <laughs> Look, I could continue. Lung capacity. Vertical yeah. leap is yeah. under 32. You know, Smoking that, two packs a day. Okay. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> right, you, yeah, you said enough. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm convinced. I get, I get it. it so, yeah, you see uh, now yes. why I couldn't. 100%. Uh, but so you were so in, funny. I was like, you know, he's got this great radio voice, you know, and I was like, does he, does he, does he smoke? And then he's we're cultivating you know, it. Out was, I'm hanging out with you. I'm like, man, you're looking good. Are you the working out? Oh man. Like I'm eating good and I'm working out. My wife's working out. Like <laughs> shit, man, I feel better. And the next thing you know, I see him out on a smoke break. I was like, damn, and you're smoking. And he's like, yeah, you know, it's coming. It's, it's soon. But it's just funny, like people that really work out and are healthy and smoke is always yeah. a funny. Yeah, it we, makes for a great. Dude, I'd voice. smoke in the gym if they'd let me. I'm on the fucking treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you were born in 1952, you would have been. Hey, we walk in this. Funny th- enough. What's, oh yeah, oh, right. <laughs> this, this this guy, he, he's he, you know, he's on a, some sort of a fucking diet now. Maybe it's working, maybe it's not. But he's he's trying, right? But every we go to the gym in the morning, and he gets out of the car. It's a short walk from the car to the gym. He lights a cigarette. And the first thing he does when you walk out of the gym is light a cigarette, too. I'm like, dude. Retro man. I'm yeah. no expert. I'm not like, you know, a nutritionist. I don't know a lot about eating well or working. I, but these lungs have went through a workout. Like, they deserve a treat. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's good. I think you should probably not do that. Nah, that's, you're listening to all the propaganda in the last 25 years. Yeah, okay. it's such it's bullshit. Not, it's not that I bad. Know. Yeah. yeah, guys won the Olympics smoking cigarettes in 1972. That shit hasn't that's changed. True. Lungs yeah. aren't that much different. No. Yeah, it's the same lungs. Right? Yeah, that menthol is like a pre-workout. All right. Yeah. <laughs> this is oil whiskey, not oil whiskey and tobacco. And tobacco. As far as <laughs> and I, new, oil whiskey and new Round Cheers. two. Cheers, Round guys. two. Yeah. And what are we having this time? Well, new it's riff. A new riff. Yeah, What's that, the proof on that? It's, Let's see. It's new riff, single barrel, 112. It tastes smooth. It, it yeah. tastes really good. That's been sitting there on open. I've got a few new riffs at home. It's completely different. That wow. are great, yeah. but I was nervous about just jumping into the 112 mm, to just yeah. sip it, but as a cocktail. Very good. And it takes it Great. up just enough. Yeah. Takes the spirit we, level. We learned something. One higher. Today. Yeah. This is great. The spirit level. Did spirit I get that level. right? You did. Yeah. Spirit level. Yeah. Did you know, um, so I went to a museum south of Atlanta recently. Um, it's the Georgia Agriculture Museum, which of course I can get no one to come with. You know, like you ride by with your family and they're like, God, Dad, I mean, what is it with you and these museums and that shops? Awesome. And yeah, that'd be right up your alley. I would love that. Yeah, I you really could would. add that to your they, old man yeah, knowledge. Dude, they yeah. give me so much shit for useless knowledge about stuff. But, I that, love but it. we you also lean on you when it's time. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. For something completely useless. That, yeah. Like, <laughs> trivia yeah. fucking kills yeah. it. We're doing game night <laughs> this weekend. There's nobody else I want on my team than him <laughs> because he knows things. Josh knows things. Just a little you bit of everything. You've never known what a raccoon's pecker looked like. <laughs> no, I, I would not. Yeah. What was the description you told me? There's something. There's a bone in it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, you're crazy. Wow. Google oh, it. Well, did I get any, just not to derail this, <laughs> but it's a fucking pot. We can do whatever the fuck we want. Did I get any type of vindication on the falconer <laughs> thing. Did he did. He was, well, uh, that was me and John. Yeah, but did John not send you the video of the falconer with the was guy so, sending the falcons to oh, go? Oh, yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> we were walking through the shop of this fucker. It's like, oh, we should get a falconer in here and just send a falcon out to go, like grab things. Like, how is that a thing? Like, who, where is yeah, there a falconer? Companies. If you've got like <laughs> a rodent problem or a bird problem and stuff, you hire a falconer and they bring in the falcon. And they're trained to go and kill <laughs> and we, stuff. We thought it was complete how do bullshit. We get, how do we get here from the two-headed penis <laughs> chihuahua? Because Josh knows things. Yeah, just no useless things. Back so uh, a year, a year and a half down. later, I'm looking on Instagram, just aimlessly death scrolling, <laughs> and a video comes up of a guy who is a falconer for hire who brings his falcon around and fires it off to catch birds and bats that are yeah. in buildings. And yeah, that's pretty badass. Josh, <laughs> Josh was vindicated. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So back to, so you went to the Agriculture Museum. But they, this is just all old, is this Georgia only? Or is it just it's agriculture, a, it's, combines and all the old equipment? I mean, equipment? the idea was, so there's a little town called Tifton, Georgia. In the, I know the, Tifton very well. Okay. so you got a uh, huge fight there for a football game in 10th grade. Oh, my God. Yeah, in Tifton, Georgia. Wow. Yeah, I could see that. It is, it is Georgia red, baby. Yep. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, north of Valdosta, which is not a metropolis, and south of Macon, not another metropolis. And so anyway, Mr. Tift set up this kind of, uh, almost like the Henry Ford museum, Greenfield village, <clears throat> but it was Georgia during the kind of cotton and Peanuts. tobacco days. 
uh, late 1800s, I believe. And he set up a village. So he's got, you know, the, the, uh, train that goes around. It's got a steam train that runs around the place and he has a still. And this is how the story got popped talking about spirits mm -hmm. was that I didn't realize turpentine was made from, uh, basically distilling just like boiling, just like you would do like a spirit, um, pine gum. So you kind of get the sap almost like maple syrup or whatever out of a tree. Sure. Pile it to get, put it together. And then at some point you boil it and the spirit that comes off of the boil of the uh, pine gum is turpentine. Well, didn't they call it spirit gum? Isn't it? There was, yeah, there was some, uh, so Google, yeah. we gotta Google that because yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. There is some, how do you not know this? There's some something I don't gum. know. Let's see. Yeah. Did you, does it not <clears throat> amaze you though? The first guy that's just boiling some fucking pine sap for no fucking reason in distill. And it's like, this would be a good cleaner. Right. Well, I mean, for, you know, I don't know, man, this may be too deep, but, you know, throughout humanity, you know, the word idea didn't even, you know, like people making up new shit wasn't a thing until the Greeks. You know, like the word idea literally comes straight from, you know, the Greeks and the age of enlightenment. Before then, it was like an idea. No, you, you, you take your sticks, you make your hut, and then you make a fire, then you try to find some woman within, you know, like 30 miles or you take a weaker man's woman and you beat him over the head yeah. and say, you're with me now. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. There wasn't, but, uh, like you said, free thinking yeah. or, or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of years of evolution, if you believe in that, which I do. And, you know, then all of a sudden, like, you know, a couple thousand years ago, somebody's like, man, we should think of new things. What a concept. I'm going to yeah. call it an idea. <laughs> this is going to be great. Game changer. Cool. Look at us. Like, dude, we, all of us in this room make a living coming up with fucking ideas yeah. every day. And now the right. human race is so fucking lazy, we don't even want to have our own ideas anymore. We're going to pay computers to do it. And fucking, hey, come up with a new idea for a new business. The fucking AI shit. That's coming full fucking Oh, circle. I tried it this week. Did you? Yeah. How'd it work? It's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I said, here's the, here's the question I said, and you guys will appreciate this probably more than many. I said, <clears throat> how would you go, how would you find customers who want to build and I, I put in Riddler because Riddler is just like a way to say an expensive high end car. Yep. Yes. And I'm paraphrasing, Sure. but I put it somehow I put it in there and it was like, I mean, it didn't even blink. I mean, the motherfucker just literally just like spit stuff and out. spit the shit out. And it was like, go to shows, network with car clubs, um, you know, Dude. do blogs, go to YouTube post, you know, do social media posts. I mean, it was literally like the shit that, those Every, of those of us in the niche know yeah. what to do, but it's all changed so fast in 20 years. But that fucker, like literally this fucking computer, just like it, like pull that shit out of air. It doesn't know about high ride building and it knew exactly what to do. It does. <clears throat> and we're three months away from becoming self-aware. I'm yeah. serious. Josh, Ter full blown Terminator. You brought that up. Like Josh brought that to the table. Just talking about it. He's been talking about it for like a few months and I'm like, Hey, it's like, whatever. No, like, shit's whatever. legit. Just, like babbling, you know, he's no, it's legit. Mm, complete moron. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Keep going. But, <laughs> yeah. Saying more nice things. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to come, it's going to, it's going to come full yeah. circle. Technology's going to come. Right, no, this is going to come, yeah, this is going to come full circle. But, you. but I mean, within like two months of Josh just bringing mm -hmm. it up, I mean, it's a full blown thing yeah. now. Like Phil, you, fired something off on there for like some random email or something. And I remember you showed me the response and you're like, Oh my God, that's yeah. insane. Like yeah, it's fucked up for me I right now. To write like some description, just fucking around with it. I saw a bunch of stuff on Instagram. It's like write a description about a roadster shop C10 chassis. And it fired this stuff off. You're like, Oh, this guy knows what the fuck he's talking there about. There went my job. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Dude, for me, right. Like I can I send emails really well. Okay. I can do that. And I can set my browser on, private browsing. Those are the two things I'm, I, I can knock out when it comes to technology. How often? And I can send that? a text message. Other than that, like I'm, dude, I'm the last guy that's, I will be the last human being that summons the AI. <laughs> <laughs> I will be the last. <laughs> yeah. My I brother, my that. brother in law is like that. He's funny, Ben. He's always <laughs> like, he's a non adopter. He's like the opposite of the adopter. I'm an yeah. adopter. And so I'm like, oh yeah, new. Fuck yeah. I want that shit. Get it. Yeah, that that works for me. That'll help me build something better. Fuck yeah, I'm in. 
And uh, but he's the opposite. He's funny. He's like smartphone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I would. I don't need a smartphone. You know, I don't need to text. Text? Who's gonna text? I mean, and every time, next thing you know, two years later, and he's the he is all in. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm all about it with equipment, like tools, equipment. Hell yeah. Yeah. I'm all over it, but yeah, just like personal technology, not not so much. Yeah, I'm ready to drop it. Yeah. You and Mike Ring. I think you. Would I like think that's why we get along so well. I think well you would like to adopt it because there's been things you've tried to use in the past. It's just like what, like what, like a GoPro camera. A fuck a GoPro camera, dude. <laughs> <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> fuck. It's the only piece of technology that has one button. Yeah, it's you would a, think it's literally one. Well, button. put two on it so you don't have to press the one multiple times. <laughs> All right, so let me get this straight. So Ring Brothers, the technology hot rod builders, aren't into technology? Oh, Mike Ring's got a flip phone. It's like the last one in existence. Yeah. Yeah. He builds a, like, super tech car like he does, and he's got a flip phone? Mike calls me still to this day from a landline. (laughs) He doesn't call myself. I'll get a voicemail. You know the Amish. Even yeah, my mom, basically. my they mom came here on a horse and buggy. <laughs> my mom Shit. dumped the landline. Even uh, Jim, at least, will exchange text messages. Mike, I'll get like I'll get a message from one of the sales guys up front, an email. Uh, call Mike Ring at, and here's the number. Like, Mike Ring can't. I mean, God damn, Mike, call my cell phone, <laughs> right? Even if you're calling from a landline, you can still call call my cell phone. This is me now publicly addressing this. So, Mike, okay, <laughs> just call the cell phone. I didn't really expect to come on this podcast, you know, the Roacher <laughs> Shop, which is the, you know, technology innovator of the chassis world in our, in our industry. Mm-hmm. And that there, we're going to talk about flip phones that I didn't see coming. See, that's the thing. That's yeah. the beauty of this podcast and mm-hmm. you never whiskey. Know. You just know whiskey you know. is yeah. fucking amazing. Yeah. Let's, let's cheer to some whiskey. Cheers to whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. Solid so cocktail. Who was the, uh, <clears throat> who was the first response from those handwritten letters with the chop mark on it? Um, I had an offer from Alan Johnson who built, you know, has built some we, badass yeah, shit over the years. Alan. Yep. He works his fucking ass off. Um, but I did not want to live in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not in there in Gadsden. Da- yeah. I did not want to live in Gadsden. <laughs> I'd already lived in Texas, been there, done that. And so I, I played volleyball in college and, um, was just, and I was cold as shit in Wyoming. Yeah. And I was ready to get the fuck out and uh, had a roommate, Boudreaux, who I'd known from college, who lived in L.A. and was working in movies and uh, lived by the beach. So I was just praying to God somebody would hire me over there. And uh, SoCal hired me. (laughs) And so uh, there are a lot of funny stories, but like probably the most, you know, like the most amazing one was when I was building my 50 Plymouth chop top in my home garage, I had one poster and it was a rod and custom picture of uh, Copperhead, ZZ Tops, 50 shoebox, lengthened doors, and uh, Pete Shaporis from the SoCal group and Jake Jacobs and them at Pete's house before he bought the, the building down in uh, Pomona. Um, they built that car for Gibbons, <clears throat> and I had this on my wall, right? Yep. And I'm building this chop top, like, oh, my God, da, da. And when I went to, I had my little stall where they put me in to learn sheet metal, literally next to me was the ZZ Top Copperhead, the fucking car. Damn. And I was like, and that's the that's moment I knew. Awesome. I was like, I'm on, I'm out, I call it on the river. Like I'm on the path. I'm on my path where I should be. I'm in the right place. That's the poster right there. Yeah. And, uh, oh, that's cool. You know, at that moment I just knew like I'd found my calling and that I was in the right you know, I kind of found my, my place in life and found my, my spot, you know? Damn. Fucking ads. Dude, I hate to say it. Like, this is going to make me look like not a great hot rodder, but I'm honestly not familiar with that particular car. Yeah, they took <clears throat> a second door and lengthened the door. So they took a second door and welded it, you know, kind of in the middle. I feel like they, yeah, there's the sketch. I think they stretched is it out. Is that a Tom Taylor sketch? Yeah, I believe so. Um, so I think oh, they stretched cool. it about. Yeah, there's. Yeah, there, there you go. Huh. The car looks good. It's good. It's got man. I mean, Pete and that whole that one crew. holds up till like today. A lot of them you kind of get a little dated, but that thing. No, dude. Yeah, that's what. That's the sick shit about that. You know, Shaporis. If you look any of his work. Yeah. I mean that shit. Jake Jacobs. That guy was a fucking master. I mean. Double the, firsty, Jake Jacobs. <clears throat> 
the um, you know, the proportion and the the understanding of classy classic. That's a, that's a Stanford drawing. Mm. Oh yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Stanford was awesome too. Yeah, I should do something with him. That'd be fun. So you were you were at SoCal Speed Shop then pre Jimmy Shine era. No, Jimmy, right so Jimmy started time? six months before me. So okay. I started two two weeks before they went from Pete Shapores Group and they changed the name. So they handed us their T-shirts. Yeah. And I'm like, cool, I'm Pete Shapores Group. And then all of a sudden, two weeks later, like, all right, we're SoCal. <laughs> I was like, all right, whatever. Yeah, that's a little better. Yeah. Sounds yeah, way better name, way better brand. A little better. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the shop was insane back then, man. Like, fuck, Jake. That's, it's and, a cool era. Yeah. Uh, Tim Carambia and Tim Beard, who painted, they were, they painted ZZ Top Eliminator and um, did a lot of just super high end paint. Um, and then obviously Pete and um, Jimmy Shine and um, God, it's just a whole crew of fucking studs, man. That place was. Yeah, that was a neat era I mean, for me. That was like that was when I was just kind of getting into the the industry, you know, as a semi professional. And your Jimmy Shine's truck was like that was the icon. You know, I mean, I knew of a lot of the older <clears throat> cars and some of the iconic stuff, but that little thirty four pickup, fuck yeah, that Jimmy Shine did was like, oh fuck. I mean, that was the that was the shit. It was so. You remember being that? I was there every night, and every night he was badass. making that normally. Yeah, like we were there together. You know? Being that age, our, our, you know, our age when we were so heavily influenced, you're looking at that. We, I hadn't. I don't know. You guys might be. I hadn't traveled like we ended up doing with shows at that point in time. That might as well have been on the other side of the fucking planet. California. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Distance wise, you yeah. seemed like it was. Yeah, it was another whole fucking other world. shit. That's like, how do you even get there? Yeah, it's like well, it's you so, were in Alabama. Yeah. So. yeah but horse it, and it, carriage it, isn't that's a long yeah. ride. That's like crossing the Great Plains. Horse and carriage. That's, that's why you had two of them. <laughs> right. One of them wouldn't make it. Yeah. The, uh, but you know, and then like when you when you're traveling and you're doing shows and stuff like that, things tighten up, you know, and it doesn't it doesn't seem <clears> like yep. so vast, so far away, so anything, you know. But yeah, that that there's some cool ass shit come out in that area. I mean, he, those it, like that that truck really started a movement you yep. know that was the you know you hate the word rat rod right but that was you had that professionally whole, built uh, rat rod yeah i mean yeah. i'm not going to discredit that truck and call it that but that truck really Hardcore started hot rod that yeah. truck really started that whole movement because people looked at that and they were like well I, yeah. can, I can do this no you know you can't do that but you can do something yeah. that kind of looks sort of like it yeah it's just the bare steel yeah. the stance and the super chop that i think yeah. that you you bypass what <clears throat> the problem was is it looked more obtainable it did it yeah. wasn't but it, it did. wasn't yeah, but yeah. for the for, <laughs> it was pretty custom for, for guys <laughs> yeah. looking at they're doing their garage instantly they're like oh in their mind they're like i can i can do something like that and if if he's getting this much attention then what i can do must be pretty good because it's a completely different than looking at you know cadzilla or something like that or whatever where a guy is in his home garage being like yeah i fucking can't do that <laughs> you know uh, but well there's like i mean at the end of the day like once you once you go into paint, like once you've got to metal, you know, I didn't care. Like, you know, Texas T was my first bike. I didn't, you know, want to show off my sheet metal skills. But at the end of the day, you know, in a car, once you decide you're going to paint the motherfucker, I mean, it's another thousand hours. Thousand, another thousand dollars. Thousand hours <laughs> at least. I mean, Hell at yeah. least. Fuck. At yeah. least. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's a couple thousand hours. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, like, I don't have the math in front of me, but once you tabulate that back when it's your hobby and you're doing it nights and weekends that's a year or two years dude i mean it's fucking hard it you know so you know to be able to do like what you guys have really done with survivors and you know like i think in california and texas you know that was a you know, that's a difference in culture from when i in atlanta my patinaed 44 georgia gold that i drive daily right now um you know it's just survivor what you're doing it's yeah. the same idea it's leather ac magnesium quick change you know um it's got aluminum wide five wheels right but it, on the outside it's nasty as shit you know well that's like we haven't that's it's interesting you brought that up because we haven't really delved off into that in you know close to two seasons on the podcast but it is the idea like you said once you decide to go to paint 
you know, it's exponential. But it's not the paint job, even the body work and paint job in and of itself, as astronomically expensive as that is to do it. Taking the paint off. It's just, it. that's trim. Well, it's trim. It's bumpers. It's glass. It's It's hinges. It's weather strip. Everything. All of those things. Because you have decided to do that, it's all the ancillary items that are honestly probably three times what the decision to go to paint and body, you know, or the actual act of doing paint and body. It's kind of like when you were single, which I'm not anymore, but when you decided not to wear a condom. (laughs) And then the shit got a lot more serious. I mean, it gets a lot more serious (laughs) at that (laughs) point. I mean, up until then, it's fun and games. You're just having a good time. You know what I mean? And then you're like, I'm going to blow it apart. I'm going to take this thing off. And you're like, they're going to go, oh, shit. They're going to cut this out. This is for real. The lack of sensation, the lack of sensation is (laughs) Not worth yeah. <laughs> Quite possibly the best analogy I've ever yeah. heard in my life. Really Honestly. Is. Like, that's brilliant. Yeah. Really. It because seems uh, like a simple decision. Yeah. 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 Like, oh, let's paint it. Feels better. You know, it'll Your better. world yeah. is fucked. I love, no, I love you. I love you, too. Oh, yeah. 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 No, I'll pay the chrome bill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Oh, will you? Well, here's the chrome bill. I told you. It's going to be nice. Like, oh, shit. Nine yeah, no, I don't want to pay. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> I can pay half. I mean, so I pay 18 a years, huh? 18 years. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. <laughs> and this is when we started, you know, like complete tangent. This is when we started hotrodfinancing.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> log because on. log on right now. You might need to finance it over 18 years. <laughs> uh, when you so, decided you're fully committed, but you just can't yeah. make that payment. We, I think we need to document this because this podcast will live on forever so if we say it on here then it's a thing and it's always there i expressed this to barry with the el camino the 60 el camino which is coming out this summer and it's gonna be an awesome car but inquired about painting it i said don't paint it don't paint it because it's not just a paint job as soon as you take that beautiful patina off it's chrome in the bumpers Grill. polishing the trim or yep. chrome in it's the trim. everything it's doing all the seals it's doing the glass it's doing this so now it's now it's a full bill it Doubles the price. You're getting into like, oh, let's gap the car. That's only a right. thousand dollars. Everything's weld in the doors. It's, it's, everything's just. Let's it's just old, fill this, and let's just tuck the bumper. The problem let's is, just, is the, let's just. Let's it's just. down to a phrase of, well, if I'm gonna do this, <clears throat> I might as well do this. Because if you're right. gonna do it this nice, I might as well. If we're gonna paint it, we might as well do the chrome. If we're gonna do the chrome, we might as well do the trim. Well, if we're gonna do the trim, we might as well straighten it. If we're gonna do that, we might as well. If you might as well, every time you say might as well. Be prepared to pay. And then you've done these 50 things, so you're not just going to leave this as is. You right. have to do the next 20 because you've done the previous 50. Especially so. when you didn't set out at the beginning because then you end up coming full circle. If you start changing your mind through the thing, then it's like, well, I mean, initially, you know, that you know that LS was fine, but if, if we're going to do this, we might as well. If, if you have to say we might as well during the job, it's fucking costing you. <laughs> Am I right? I don't know. I mean, you're going to make me vomit because I'm just thinking about all the times that that's happened. But, you know, like to me, I don't know. I don't want to, you know, that's the hard part of, of our industry. And I feel like probably most people won't understand like how hard those conversations can be and where they lead. But I feel like, you know, what you guys will understand and I hope the audience will understand is that when you're committed to, making the best product that you can and building something that's as badass as you're possibly capable. All of us know that's what we're telling the customer when we go, when we say, look, you should just, um, I've got a great client who just brought back her 65 Mustang. She was my closing attorney on our building that we did a few years ago. Her name's, um, Kathleen, but her car is named Veronica and she's awesome. She's this bubbly, downtown Atlanta, beautiful sky rise, 30, 30th floor overlooking the city. I mean, this shit is fucking polished. Like I put on a shirt, you know, like I actually like, you know, cause I knew I'm like, I looked at the address. I'm like, damn, this is, maybe cool. I'm going downtown. I gotta get my dress shirt. Exactly. On. Yeah. I still drove a patina truck down there, but I'm like, <laughs> so I'm, I walk in this place and Kathleen's like, Oh my God, I'm like so excited to meet you. Like, um, I've got a Mustang. It's called Veronica. My dad gave it to me when I was 16 and I just want her to run and I want to drive her in the Atlanta shit traffic. And can you put air conditioning in it and make it fuel injected and put a V8 in it? And I was like, hell yeah, we can do that shit. And so we did it for, I don't know, a couple of years ago. 
I guess about a year ago, she brought it back for, you know, it was supposed to be the 500 mile oil change, check the death bolts kind mm-hmm. of deal. And, uh, and it was 1500 miles, which is awesome. So she's driving it. She's having a great time. We didn't get one phone call of like something happening. So we were just pumped, you know, and when it came down to, she was like, do you think you should paint it? And I was like, look, I would love to take your money and put it in our paint shop right now. Cause I could use the work, but you're going to enjoy this car way more. If you just take it as is and drive the shit out of it. And if some dumb ass in Atlanta backs into you and you've got insurance and at that point, let them pay for the fucking paint job. Yep. You know what I mean? Go enjoy it. Go yeah. have fun. Yeah. Because you're worried about just like most people that are, that are have a conscience or are going to be around in this industry for long. You want to make sure that customer is as happy as possible with what your creation is, right? Yep. And what you can do. It would be so easy to say yes to every single thing that the guy asks or the girl asks or anything like that, knowing full well that it ain't going to go along, go, go well. And you can just get their money until they run out of money and be like, you know what? I'm sorry it took them too long or it took this or whatever and, and go on about. There's so many shops out there that are so like worried about telling the truth of being like, no, dude, I, there's physically no way possible we can do it for X amount of dollars. You Versus there's a being, lot of shops out there worried about that or not worried about that? They're not worried about okay. telling the truth. You know, there's, there's too many shops well, because out they there. feed their family. They I got, mean, that's how they make their you've living. You've got to have it. But I think that it's, I'm not saying you should never take any work. I think it's, it's the difficult conversation of being real sure, it's with that hard. customer and build the like, right car for what they want to do with it. Exactly. I think, I think the best example is like, if you just want the like honest to God truth, right at the roadster shop, there's two owners, it's Phil and Jeremy, and the only cars that we've ever owned that are built by the Roadster Shop are all patinaed cars. We, we don't paint vehicles for ourselves, right? Because the goal with them is is you want to drive it, you want to enjoy it. it, right? And you want yep. the, you want something that you can jump in and really have a good time with. Yeah. I mean, that's our focus. Right and there's now. nothing wrong with doing a full paint, full show, full chrome, all that kind of stuff. The problem is is the act the the legit expectations or right. the accurate expectations going into it of knowing like yes I'm full aware of how much chrome costs I'm full aware of how long this is going to take sure. I I'm in it for yeah. the long haul but honestly <clears throat> being in it for the long haul and then you know there's so many times you dance around it you know well it's going to be yeah. expensive oh yeah I mean it's gonna, but talking hard numbers being like this car that you like so much this costs x amount of dollars right this costs 300, 400, 500, 600,000, whatever it is. And if they're like, yeah, n- no problem. You know, I don't have an issue with that. I, that's fine. I know I'm going to do this, this, and this. But generally it's, you know, oh, no, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do anything near like that. Well, everything you described is that and then some. So we've got a, you know, am I, am I right? Like, is, I is, think, is, uh, I mean, yeah. to me, the weird thing uh, in America at this point, you know, this was a hobby that people did on their own. And like in L.A., I feel like when I was there, there was so much car culture associated with Los Angeles. And I think partially it was the, um, you know, the weather. So you've got beautiful weather all the time. So you can have a beautiful car and not worry that it's getting rained on or snowed on or very similar to Chicago. Yeah. Atlanta. I mean, you know, whatever, like there, you can have an old car that can sit outside because they don't have fucking room in their garage and live and be fine. You know, one and two, their their housing is expensive as shit, so they're having to pay all their money to their house. So, do you really want to go spend a hundred grand on a brand new car when you can have a twenty thousand dollar vintage pickup that will run for the next forty five years of the rest of your fucking life? No. And so, there's almost a little bit of a Cuba in California where you can live with these old cars. And it doesn't really matter that it doesn't have any fucking AC because the weather's great. And then it doesn't matter that it doesn't have windshield wipers because there's no fucking rain. And yeah. it doesn't matter that it's got holes in the floorboard because it gives you better circulation and makes you feel better on your feet, you know. And um, so there's this culture of kind of keeping these old cars moving and, and people working on them and the legacy of the kind of world war two guys and the, the Boeings and the Lockheeds and the, you know, like the, the craftsmanship that was based there, 
you know, whereas in Atlanta, we've, it's a lot of new money and a lot of marketing and a lot of sales guys. And they come in and like, I sh- Hey man, like, you know, I'm a baller and I'm like, I should be able to just buy this. And I'm like, dude, you know, you work for UPS, n- not as an executive, you're a driver. Yeah. Well, how much to do this Mustang? A and shit like, ton. And I'm like, it's a lot. I'm like, this is, this, these are people that are really like a lot more wealthy than me. And, you know, the other day and I pulled it, he's got a Mustang that I think he got from his uncle and, and I pull him under the thing and I was like, look, dude, this is a really simple car. I'm like, it's a great, so what I, how I got into the hobby. It's a really simple car. There's a little leaf springs. There's a very simple gas tank. There's, there's a carburetor. You can learn on this car. I'm like, dude, you can buy that, get that car from your uncle, find a friend, find the Mustang club. YouTube, it's the easiest time it's ever been to learn about how to like work on these things. Yep. You know what I mean? But for somehow these people think that like they should be able to just come to us and get it like, like it's a gallon of milk. <laughs> I'm like, this is not a gallon of milk. This is like buying a fucking sculpture for your house. Right. It's like buying the entire farm full of cows <laughs> <laughs> and then getting the milk. This is like well, getting a gold sculpture out front. Yeah. You I've, know? Got a, like, I've got a quick, I've got a question. Just so you're, you're an educated guy. You're a smart guy. Um, We've talked about the the sudden stop of the motorcycle industry, you know, and obviously not stop. You know, it went on, it splintered, it did its own things, whatever. However, Temporary break. It was never, it has not even to this date gotten back to what it was, say, 2005, 2006, right? Sure. Um, for whatever reason. Why do you think, one, cars have been so popular for so long, the barrier to entry is... 10 times what it was in the motorcycle world for car, for custom car stuff, right? As a whole, for most part of what people are wanting, you could get a pretty cool bike for 25, 30 grand, right? You're not going to get a pretty cool car for 25 or 30 grand. Why do you think it's still continued, which, you know, glad it has, like it has, and people are doing whatever they can to figure out a way to to have built or build, buy parts from us, buy parts, and have that dream done. What's the difference? Jesus, man, you guys are pushing deep right now. Yeah, that, that, that's super deep. Ugh, I like it. No, I like it. Yeah. It, but it's fucking deep. You've been working on that for a while. No, it just, honestly, it just, it just can't, we're I, just talking good, about I mean, it. But I think, I don't have the I, answer. It's obviously not a setup question. I think that, <clears throat> I think there's a disconnect between, for, uh, a lot of millennia, you know, men and women who are living together had different relationships than we have today. And I think that we're trying to figure out what it means. And I know in my own household, both me and my wife both work. We both have our own bank account. We both, you know, like carry our own weight of the bills. And, uh, and I think it used to be that dudes just kind of, you know, told their ladies like, Hey man, this is what the fuck's happening. I make the money and you stay at home. And obviously they're still careful. Know, that, that's, that's still how I run. That my still house has, also. <laughs> be yeah. careful. And I, and, no, it's I good. Saw, I saw that one coming. <laughs> no, it's good. Like, I mean, at the other day, like, you know, that's, everybody, everybody has something on the other side that they yeah, think yeah. would be, you know, like I have a working, amazing brain woman who's smart as fuck and works right. her ass off and makes money. And, you know, like it's an amazing page is an incredible and amazing woman. Must yeah. be nice. <laughs> I wouldn't mind having fifty percent of the help around the house. Yeah, you're gonna have fifty <laughs> percent of your more, fucking uh, money after this help. thing airs. <laughs> no, but I mean the other day, like it'd be cool to just it was funny because, you know, hopefully I'm not digging out, you know, too much family business. But her mom is <laughs> no, like, I think it's all out. Her mom <laughs> is like giving her shit this weekend over spring break because yeah, uh, her mom uh, is like Cannon, um, so what do you like you normally eat? Mom just makes, you know, microwave pizza. <laughs> mm. uh, and so this week, like Paige has been making dinner like every night. I mean, to the point to where we were like just stopping by to grab some food on the way back from picking up from soccer or whatever. And she's she like, I made dinner like, da, da, da. I'm like, well, I mean, we didn't expect you to make dinner. I mean, you're amazing at making dinner. But you're working work girl. I mean, you know, we don't expect sure. it. So anyway, I think the dynamic between men and women is just 
it's in a spot where we're trying to figure it out because the, in the old days, like, yeah, dude's like, Hey man, I make the money and I want to buy myself a high ride or a, if I want a motorcycle and I may kill myself on it, who fucking cares? Yeah. And I think because the split has become different, the girls, you know, wait on how they, um, you know, put their input onto family expenses and family safety and you know, that kind of shit has just changed. Yeah. So they're they're more cool with spending that money oh, on coming out of trash is a car right Absolutely. versus a motorcycle Absolutely. because of the danger. Absolutely. I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> Absolutely. I get what you're saying. I didn't mm-hmm. that, that If you spend 100 th- if you spend $100,000 on a bike your your wife's like you can't put any kids in it. Right. Whereas we can't if you've got trips a on it, we can't go anything. Lincoln Continental convertible one of my favorite cars. That's you cool. know, then a lot, a lot of like, for I, I had, don't build one. Find one that's in good working order and do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, fuck with the convertible top on one of those. Did you? Ha- did, yeah. did you have uh, the what you call it rest- restoration guy come do yours? The convertible top guy, the one that I travels work? around in the RV. No, I took it down to Lincoln Land. Okay, the, where is Lincoln Land? Uh, Clearwater, Florida. Most people, I talk about it all the time. Most people don't understand the Lincoln Continental convertible top system. I, I don't want to touch and one. know what's behind the seat and what's in the rear door panels. It's like, like a space, you've it's seen a, it. It's, you've a, got it's, one. it's yeah, a space shuttle. It's oh, like it shoots and ladders, isn't it? It's the absolute. It's the under like nobody talks about that fucking car. It yeah. literally is a space shuttle. It yeah. is a space shuttle. You know, you're absolutely right. And I think it's a lineage from the Sunliner. There was the hard top convertible that yes. came back in the fifth. 57, well, correct me if I'm wrong. To 59. Yeah. 57 to 59. So the deuce um, the story that I remember was the deuce went to his head engineer. It was like, hey, I want this hard top convertible to like retract into the back. That was still mostly hydraulics and very limit, very limited it's, on electronics. It's a nuclear submarine. On the Lincoln, I mean, literally yeah. <laughs> there is, there is, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there is in the mid to high teens of relays and the mid to high teens of limit switches. I'll go ahead. This is a break brought to you by Yummy Old Fashions. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Oil & Whiskey. That's a great <laughs> brand name, Yummy Old Fashions. Sorry. There's something soothing about that. It is very soothing. <laughs> it's like a bring us, bring us back down, dude. Those I, I always have to like uh, slap myself when I see one on eBay or uh, Facebook Marketplace because I love those early Lincolns, and you see one that it's bagged, it sits right, and then you're like, no, I, that's a that's I'm a gonna foolish. Get a that is a foolish. I, you know, you know what? I don't think so. Like I have two of them, and I don't, I don't, Do I really? don't agree. Yeah, I don't agree. <clears throat> there were the Lincolns got a bad rap, and. Um, There's a lot of moving parts. It's a complex That's car. Right. It was a luxury well, car. What's the antenna power antenna ran off of? Power steering. The antennas run off the power steering. How the, the fuck? wipers are the wipers are run off the power steering. Wipers are ran off power steering, and the, isn't the power antenna? I don't, uh, I off don't, of the same. I don't think off so. Of the wipers. I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I it was the wipers. Wrong. Maybe it was the wipers. The There's, wipers definitely. Yeah, I know that for a fact because when I took mine over and I've got we were working on my two door, and uh, I got the power steering. Uh, we put a new power steering pump on it, and yeah, blah blah blah. And all of a sudden, I go you know running down the street and I drove the thing daily. I put ten thousand miles on that car over the last few years, and I turn on the wipers, and all of a sudden they're like. Whew, 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 whew. And I'm like, what the fuck happened to my wipers? <laughs> I call my I, I like, new high flow power dude, steering pump. What the, I call Chris because, you know, I mean, we're a hot rod shop. At the end yep. of the day, this is a mechanic job. Change the belts, yep. change the hoses, put a new timing chain on it, get the AC running. Like I'm, my shop is not the, the right guys to do it. So I got a mechanic across the street or run it over. And uh, he goes, yeah, I didn't mess with them. And then I called Chris at Lincoln Land. And he's like, yeah, they're run off the power steering pump. Yeah, yeah. Flow control valve to yeah. turn that I, Dude, they are badass. They no, run like a motherfucker. Oh yeah. No <laughs> lie. I would rather I would rather go out there and take <clears throat> your new Bronco Raptor, remove the transmission, disassemble it, and rebuild it before I would rather take the door panel and replace the power window switch in no, his like that is not true. That You're, is not true. If, you've seen behind that power window of switch. Of course. In, yeah, I have. Yeah. It's not that is not there's true. There's seven that is such, there's seven thousand wires in there. That is not true. There's like 10. No, you're, there's not 10? Yes, there are like 10. No, there's eight per switch. No, and that is f- not true. That is, you're exaggerating. Four switches. <laughs> 
here's the two things. Like, here's the things about the Lincoln. Okay, so <laughs> JFK. This, this is so right, weird. <laughs> 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 That's Mary one Monroe. Yeah, you could That's get two. shot in the head. Yeah. yeah. Don't ride in Dallas. <laughs> Don't ride in Dallas with the top down. Um, so a great bumper sticker or t-shirt. <laughs> just don't piss off them. Just don't piss off the mob, and you'll be fine. You can ride anywhere. Yeah, exactly. If you, be- if you believe yeah, those conspiracy you're not, theories, yeah, you're not there's a Lincoln see, mob after you right now. You're not going to see Trump riding yeah. around in a fucking Lincoln. I Fuck those roaster that. shop guys. <laughs> they're talking shit about Lincolns. I'm not talking shit. I think they're fucking amazing. I'm saying I'm. Oh, I'm I love clear them. it. No, I'm let me clear it up. Uh, let me incapable. clear it up. Let me clear it up. That is just. Yeah, they are a complex car compared to most 1967 cars but not compared to a modern car so one thing they had you were yawning over there dude it's no it's yawning a long day yeah, we need to give this guy caffeine apologize. bourbon and cokes you no need more. to make your give me some of those new coca cola yeah uh they were like it was funny the shop guys were like yeah man jeremy can't make it like an hour like i mean how does he make it for two hours? Like, oh, with my in meetings? Yeah. Are they saying? Yeah. It's just a, yeah, that's a focus thing. These, like, I could party all night, but like meetings? Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we're having this fun, engaging conversation. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. yeah. enjoying this. He's He's about about on on his ass. Ass. I apologize about that. Lord, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Lincoln's 5,500 pound car, one of the convertible is one of the most heavy passenger cars ever built in the history of America and uh, built in the heyday of the deuce GT 40 wins and Lama, the Mustang, the, I mean, the Bronco, I mean, the, the, the level of Ford badassery and sure. development in that era to me was fucking awesome. Yeah, he's going to show the old man what he's got. That's, that's, yeah, that's absolutely. Mm-hmm. Not and in so, the engine. Do what? Not in the engine. In what engine? Ford engines of the oh. era. Dude, yeah. if 427 suck. side older, one Lama, hello. What happened to yours? I mean, in your you got to take the fucking freeze I blew mine up. When you leave them full of that's water. That's I blew I'm mine up. On, that was my fault. That was a hardcore. That was yeah, hot, that was, was my fault. That was the hot rod. He had too much hot rod in his blood. Too much Southern boy. <laughs> didn't understand freezing. Too much Bam Amy. <clears throat> Texas. No, sorry. Georgia, <laughs> Texas, Georgia. Very little Alabama other than Barbara, that was a, Barbara that was a Motorsports. Very quick. Yeah. Correction. <laughs> anyway, um, so the weird thing is of all of the steel parts in that car, which is every fucking thing, the window regulator gears are were plastic. Okay. So, you know, one of the reasons that the Lincolns got a bad rap about, you know, the power you know, like the windows going out was that you have to switch those out to a steel gear. It's not hard. One of those strange things about learn down at Lincoln land is like you, if instead of tearing the entire thing apart, you drill out three spot welds and they know where to do it. Cause obviously they've done a million times. We did it on car fix one time you drill out these three spot welds. Then you can just pull the mechanism out. There's an aftermarket pop in the steel gear and it's basically done. And then the only other thing that they do tend to do is that the the switch is an old mechanical switch. Um, you know, the seals are 1960s convertible. Mm. And so, you know, they can get corroded. But otherwise, like that, that car is like a really solid car. They're, they're great cars. And they're I, solid wasn't, car. I wasn't throwing shade. It's the technologically advanced systems in there. I mean, again, you're. The rear windows come down for the top to go up. Sure. And they, they, that's shit that they're just now perfecting in 2023, you know, with, with windows and door. And that, there's just so much shit in it. There's no other car that I've ever worked on. Even even the Cadillacs of that era, you got a lot of wiring and doors and stuff like that and whatever, and you got some crazy shit from the, from the dash to the doors and stuff. But the Cadillacs don't hold a candle to the Lincolns in the systems and the way they, they thought about doing things. There's just so much... Not in a bad way. There's just so much stuff that's like, holy fuck, I got, you mean I got to go around there to get to here and this controls this and these limit switches. And it's just, it just takes one limit switch or one relay to go out and there's four systems that go down. It's just, it's absolutely fucking amazing when you think that it's literally, what's that, 40 something years ago? 50 years ago? Yeah, the story goes. 60 years ago? Yeah, keep going. Yeah, 55 years ago. A long time ago. Not that long ago. 
That, uh, yeah, the story goes with the old Sunliner top when the deuce was that um, he went to his engineer. He's like, hey, let's make this top go back. And I think the top mechanism is basically the same. And the engineer is like, yeah, we can't do it. And the deuce is like, we're the Ford Motor Company. What do you mean we can't make it happen? He's like, yeah, it's just we can't do it. And so he hired, like, the convertible top guru, you know, I'm assuming of the era and probably in Detroit and, uh, and paid him and like gave him his own special area, like rented him a building and put him in there and didn't tell any of the company. Said so make it fucking it happen. Was Dwight Convertible. Yeah. Yes. I was, <clears throat> so was French. Dwight, I was over here yes. trying to like roll Dwight that Dwight Convertible. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you like, damn it. The name was just on my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I knew it was right there. <laughs> I don't know that Dwight goes with that. <laughs> Dwight. Oh, it's third generation Dwight. French. It was Dwight. Yeah. Dwight. Yeah. Convertible. Dwight. Dwight. Convertible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. The bourbon's kicking in. This is good. <laughs> Phil, and Phil hates this podcast. So this is much. where people start listening. What? <laughs> Phil hates the podcast? I do. Moderately. Because we're idiots. <laughs> oh, yeah. damn. Oh, I, yeah. It's just mostly... It was, it was just funny, right? Dude. You Dwight, just like Dwight. <laughs> Dwight with Dwight. It, it, it made, that's, yeah, that's it the clicking in your brain. Pierre. 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 Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's Pierre. Seems fake. Yeah. Pierre, Pierre convertible. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, he hires you know, Dwight. He and hires and Dwight and Pierre, his... and then eventually, uh, when he's got the prototype running, he brings it back to his head of engineering at Ford, and is like, "So it doesn't work." And then, like you know. And the thing works, and he's like, yeah, fuck you. I'm the deuce. You're fired. <laughs> uh, I he got fired. So maybe. Who is the wrestler? Probably just a pissing match. Who is the wrestler that did, yeah, the, that did Generation the, X? Generation X, yeah. Do you think that, like, this was before or after that? Because I feel like that, I'm pretty sure it was before. I feel like <laughs> that. Go on, it might have been neck and neck, but I'm pretty sure it was dude, a little bit before. That dude that developed that probably... Did it. Dwight? Yeah. 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 Dwight Convertible. Dwight Convertible. <laughs> Dwight. Probably stood up. And Dwight just, Day. <laughs> Dwight and Day. And that's where the X-Frame chassis came from. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because he crossed him. For a minute, they thought he crossed him. We really should start doing drugs on this podcast. <laughs> I think it would take us to a whole other Or level. should we? We are. It's yeah. called alcohol. You're but right. I was I was yeah. very close to bringing a lot of substances just for the fuck of it. And the Is it illegal down there in Atlanta yet? Uh, this is it orange? Not really. Or medical... Not really. Oh, we're full, we're full blown legal up here. Oh yeah, Illinois. so you see, you it makes been sense. Fine. It makes sense. You know, the most liberal like state in the country next to California. Right. Yeah, illegal. Legal, legalize it all. <laughs> uh, nice. So we're we're at SoCal. We've gone around the Lincoln world. Um, Six hours later, we're take just us, like yeah. scratching the surface. Take us to where. Out. Take us to where, like, you can go, you can hopscotch through this, but we need oh, yeah, to get to where, Shine, where you get to Atlanta, where you're like, you know what, I this has been awesome, I'm living my dream, but I've got to do my own thing. Yeah, I was working for Foos, and uh, for three years, stumbled yeah. on overhauling, which is how I got my TV Just kind of blow over start. that. Give, it, <clears throat> give us a little, like, info on how you transitioned from SoCal to Foos. You're like... Um, I went to... You know, there are a couple in there. I went to, uh, eventually, I was at uh, Jeff Minford Taylor, who was the fabricator for Jeff, uh, Dan yeah. Fink, oh. who did the grills yeah, of course, <clears> the back in grills. the day. Yep. So Jeff was a Kiwi, he's a Kiwi guy, mm-hmm. and a very, very talented, classically trained um, Kiwi fabricator, sheet metal fabricator. I mean, he went through the, you know, the four or five year apprenticeship program. And like, we didn't do anything but sheet metal. So, sure. you know, like no weld marks. That, <clears throat> that was just behind Huntington Beach, just behind Chip's place. And uh, right over the railroad tracks. And it was funny because it was like three doors down from his old boss, you know, Fink. Yeah. And, uh, but a great, Great, super talented sheet metal fabricator. But, you know, at that point in his life, I think he was kind of tired. He just, he had been fabricating for so long. I think he probably needed a break. Worn out. He was worn out. 
you know, and so he didn't really want to be in the shop a lot, you know, like he taught me a lot and pushed me hard because again, we would do only sheet metal. We did only did metal work. And consequently, like if you don't have to paint the car, like me and you guys do in your own right. shop, then you don't really care how long it takes to get to the paint shop. You know, me, sure. I'm like, I'd rather save like at the end of the day, like if the gaps are good and the welding is done and the panels are within a 16th of an inch and I can get the thing, to the paint shop and spend the money. Like if it takes my old saying is like, if it takes five minutes in mud or if it takes five hours in metal work, then let's fucking mud it. Yeah. I mean, the customers, you know, would rather pay you five minutes than five hours, you know? And so, um, but if you only do metal and you don't finish the car, you don't have to worry about that. You make a perfect metal sculpture. Well, and, and you also don't know what it takes to like actually straighten it. You know, you need, that's, that's something you need to have a good understanding of. Yeah. yeah. I mean, your, your job, like depending on, again, like what you're, when I was at SoCal, what the couple of craftsmen told me was like, your job isn't to make this thing perfect. Your job is to get it to the paint shop and that the painter doesn't have to do your work. You don't have any high spots. Your gaps are good. Your everything's finished. And at the end of the day, like the painter, you know, and I grew up painting before I did metal work. So I knew kind of what the painter needed. And so you guys know, like, yeah, you can metal masturbate it as long as you want to make it look fucking beautiful right. in, you know, the Rotter's journal or wheel hub photograph session. Of course. You're still not going to put paint on it and have that laser straight. But yeah, at the end of the day, you're still yeah. going to fucking skim the thing and yep. make it perfect. Yeah. There's DA <clears throat> metal finished and then there's like actual metal finished and then there's just finishing it like for the body shop properly. Yeah. You know? just, yeah. And yeah. so that was the hard, you know, learning like through that process. And for me and my own shop, I'm like, dude, let's get what we need to get a badass paint job out of the paint shop. But let's not, I don't need to masturbate it and prove to people that we can do you know, yeah. If a customer wants to pay me to do a polished body, let's do it. Yeah. Right. Sure. I'm all in. I'm ready. But if you're going to paint the car. Yeah. He wants a shiny green Mustang. Like yeah. that's what he came in for. Like, exactly. Right. He doesn't need a shiny metal job and then a shiny Mustang. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Man. I don't know where the hell we started. Completely lost. So you're working at, <laughs> you're working at Fink. You're doing that kind of stuff. And, oh yeah. And chips down the road. Chips down the road. And, uh, I went, I was making custom bicycles on the side. And, uh, at some point I told Chip, I was like, Hey man, I'm just going to hang out down the street and wait around until hopefully you hire me because I'm ready to move on. And he's like, yeah, man, you know, Chip's so laid back and you never know. And after about a year of, uh, there was a sandwich shop right next to his, to his shop. And so I'd have lunch with everybody on the crew, come in see how the projects are coming see the, um, the, the grand master getting built. You know, I watch that thing every day for a year. So this is, so you were prospecting basically you were a prospect at that point. Yeah. Sure. Like motorcycle club, you know, you're, Absolutely. You're, you're, they're going to see, you got to fill you out and see if you're part of the team yeah. before they say, but this is also before chip has had any like major Riddler wins. He's, Chip's Chip. He's he's an he'd icon. Want, in the, a Riddler. That's he's an point, icon. Right? He's an icon in the hot rod world. But he has. Oh, he's an icon. Yeah. But but he hasn't become. They're working on the Grandmaster at that point. Uh, okay. TV sensation. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pre TV. Sure. Yeah. He was obviously an icon in our industry. Yeah. Of course. He yeah. wasn't a household. Yes. Person. Yeah. So um so yeah I'm built I'm building these custom bicycles you know and um. And I'm going, hanging out with the crew, having lunch every day. And I'm watching the Grandmaster come together. He did offer me a job before I went to Jeff's. But at that point, he's just setting up his shop. And it was kind of like, yeah, man, I can, like, throw you on this wagon. But I'm going to be really busy all over L.A. And, you know, and I was like, man, I'm, I'm just not, I don't think this is it. He's not ready for me. And at some point, it made sense. And. So anyway, he finally hired me and, you know, typical, it's funny. I, I assume that people are the same working with me because I'm like, I called him up. I was like, Hey, uh, so, you know, I quit my job, right? <laughs> like, so you're going to take me in. Cause you know, he's just, process. he's he such an artist. He he's just so to. like, la, la, la. 
money's all over. Yeah, man, come on. Yeah, we're see good. You, Monday. you yeah. know, I'm like, you know I quit, right? You have to pay me. Like, this is a job. It's not really the payment. It's just more like, you didn't forget me. Right. I'm, you know? I can be there, right? Did you yeah. draw the chopped 50 mark on your resume when you sent it to him? No, that was way post. All right. Yeah, that was way post. But anyway, man, it was awesome. It was the greatest three years probably <clears> in my life. And TV showed up and rides came in and overhauling came on and. How quick after you had been working there did overhauling happen? So we did rides first, which was probably about a year in, if I had to guess. And so I was already kind of stable with the crew, and we were all cool. And so you got to I, meet the man in black then, old Bud. Oh, oh yeah, dude. Yeah, Johnny Bud. Cash Jr. Yeah, yeah, Bud was such a character. He still is. I had actually my old. I had the overhauling crew at SEMA this year. All of them were together doing the Battle of the Builders. And my current crew of Caffeine and Octane happened to just, you know, come together. Like, did you see uh, Anchorman, the movie? Oh, <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> <laughs> who, got their, <laughs> who got their arm chopped off? Oh, my God. It was so <laughs> awesome. They're like, oh, my God, it did Fuller's first interview. And he was so nervous and scared. And, you know, 20 years later, he's actually made a career of it. And, you know, Bud tries to, you know, punch me every time I see him. Yeah, we can get Bud. Nothing to the face. We or should hair, get Bud. Right? Oh God, Bud would be good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's got to be. Got to get Bud. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> well, that's awesome. So you're doing you're doing TV thing, and at that point, obviously, you're like, see, all this work paid off. I didn't have to go be a chiropractor. I'm living the absolute American dream. Are you Are you satisfied? Are you Are you like content? I think, you know, um, it's interesting, you know, like having, uh, having success as an artist and as a, uh, as an entertainer, like some kind of weird combination of those two together. And there's like incredible satisfaction of, you know, my wife hates it cause I tell her, like, I've made it my, the, I've made it so far past the expectation of my life that I just can't even fathom that I even would have come to here. So every day is a win. Every day is a win. Yeah. And, but I think the interesting thing is, and you know, this trip coming to, to hang out with you guys in Chicago and see like one of the biggest, actually the biggest, you know, kind of hot rod manufacturing spots, uh, slash hot rodding, you know, kind of places in the country. And then I'm, Going to Rad Rides tomorrow is who? Yeah, <laughs> nobody knows. Is it as a startup then, right? Yeah, he's startup new. Yeah, he's something coming, coming around. That yeah. Rad name, it's it's getting like it's yeah. coming it's back. So old it's school. Yeah, it's right. coming people back are using around. it again. Yeah, I see. Yeah. I see. I see good things coming out of that kid Troy yeah. <laughs> down there. It's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> see, he keeps plugging away. <laughs> He'll get it. He'll, he'll figure it out. I got demoted at Wyotech because I went to the Oklahoma street ride nationals and skipped a day of school and i got demoted and you know like didn't get honorary student or whatever what? and i was like i drove to fucking oklahoma yeah you know with like a really annoying credit. kid in the back you know in, the, in a cab truck yeah you oklahoma like, used to be the big one before louisville right yeah oklahoma was yeah. the shit i remember that uh, was street ride nationals george poteet talking about yeah. oklahoma was that's Oklahoma, like, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. That's that was the that's shit. before my time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, away before my time as well. And I'm old. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, having going back that far and going through that whole process um, to come forward and just to feel like, wow, made it in this industry. But at the same time, you know, I think with success in this industry, I've always said, like, you get guys that are really great at fabricating and they're great at making parts. And they're great at yada, yada. And then all of a sudden they put themselves in the office mm -hmm. and none of us were trained in the office. And so right. it's a very hard spot to feel like I'm getting, and I do work and you know, like I am still building, I'm building a deck in my house. I'm working on all kinds of shit and I still get to build. So I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is that I'm to a point to where I feel like I'm at the top of my game when it comes to taking a piece of metal and turning it into wherever the fuck I want. And I feel like I'm at the top of that game and I feel like I use it about four hours 
10 hours a week and that's hard and that's what yeah. that's what irritates me but you is, can, you can spreadsheet the fuck out of some stuff right no hell no no i can't <laughs> do that either i can sketch some shit and i can tell somebody hey man like you need to take this and you need to shrink that and you need to move that and then i would take it over the hammer and i would take that piece and i would send it over to you know the body shop and just get it pre-prepped and I, like i understand the process and i'm coaching sure. my guys through it you know but as far as like getting my hands in it and like I'm, I want to build a fucking supercar from scratch, you know, and I've never built a supercar mid engine, you know, like I'm ready to build a supercar from scratch. And that's just where I'm at. Like in my, in my head right now, you're going to need a chassis cool. for that. I'm going to need a chassis for that. And that's where I'm at right now. But you know, like you get to the spot to where you got a crew of guys that rely on you. You got a, a good team and you got a good customers that you like. And you know, so there's, there become all of these kind of outside influences that keep you from just like, building like i want to make an icon this week you know sure. like i want to build a fucking icon this week and make the next you know kind of statement on what the fuck i can make that's cool and that's what's hard is to know that you know you're having to shortchange that a little bit and yep. i'm deciding whether and i'm at the point of my career in my life where i'm just deciding like am i going to shortchange that or am i going to f- find the way to make all that happen that's a, that is certainly a crossroads, man. I mean, I can totally relate to that because we obviously we share a very similar vision. I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you, like building that fucking supercar, you know, that's, that's really all, like all like the business stuff aside and like, you know, the roads shop, we build awesome chassis. We do this and we do that where this, we're a pretty big, you know, entity and that's, what i think about you the know last box that needs to be checked yeah that's the last but and and i reached that point where it's like okay the <clears throat> like the building it and the shaping it and the like the metal work and like that's not that's not a problem anymore like the, like i reached the point where it you went through all the challenges of like oh okay this panel is going to get away from me and this is tough and what the fuck is this doing or why did this do this when i welded it to where you like like i could shape it i can make it i can build it and it's it doesn't intimidate me but then like that slipped away, you know, yeah. like, because you got t- the business, 25 emails. Well, yeah, well, yeah the business, yeah. who's going to pay for it. Right. Yeah. The business took off yeah. and I, I would still love to do that, you know, and I, I hope that that talent is still there, you know, but like on the chassis side, like, man, I would love to dive into that and like no well, budget mid engine supercar, like the things we could do. And with, what's interesting with that is like you know forget about like the skill set that that i have or what you have when you surround yourself with like the people like what the, the people team. oh god Fuck yeah, buddy. like the people yeah. that we have now like i mean between your team and my team oh, like dude the combination shit. of that much run. fucking talent super, by the way, it just sounds like a tease it's by a the collaboration way. <laughs> super in the tv, collaboration. World, in the TV dude, world it really is yeah. because yeah. it's like, like you realize like yeah. okay like we could do some crazy shit. Yeah, 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 man, you can. You realize, like, okay, I like I accomplished X amount, but like, holy fuck, this dude is yeah amazing. Like, with the engineering guys we have, yeah. the design guys we have, dude, and like this, the little bit of skill that I yeah. may or may not dude, have. This, yeah. this is where right, Dwight convertible. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you in there. Um, All right, I, so it, the it's fucking exciting, man. Kill it's, the supercar industry. Oh, we. All right, hold yeah. on, hold on, hold on. It's right, exciting. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. Okay. I've done enough TV to know one that I have to pee and two yes. Yes. <laughs> that our cocktails are empty. Yes. Yes. So let's take a break. Yes. We'll and take a tease yes. for a second I, and come be, back to this. Before we do, before so we do that, like we're on a roll. I, I, on think, a something hot. I think that y'all two are on a roll and I'm going to continue to fuel that because I want to fucking piss off Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Recently on Change Agents with Andy Stumpf, Andy sat down with Iraq War Combat veteran and founder of the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, Damien Mander, to discuss his fight against poaching in Africa. The cost that we're going to pay in terms of dealing uh, with the climate crisis and with the increased environmental issues is going to far outweigh the investment that's needed to to hold on to what we have left. Never miss an episode. Subscribe to Change Agents with Andy Stump wherever you get your podcasts and get the full cinematic experience on YouTube at This Is Ironclad. We got a 
three. Hey, All right. So we got we back on. Tell us yeah. tell us about these beers before we get started. All right, sure guys. That. Welcome back to the Oil and Whiskey Podcast. With we are beer. switching to beer. So we got automatic Not- and Athena. <clears throat> So Creature Comforts Brewery um, is a, a brewery local at Lath- Athens, Georgia. And uh, they care about their beer. They make a really badass, yummy um, kind of mix, of course. And I, I don't, brought you... I don't know if I like it when you say yummy. I'll be honest with <laughs> really? you. Really? <It's>, yeah. <laughs> Why is that? It's a, it's a little weird. Is it? Yeah. Why is that weird? Just say delicious. Delicious. Good. That's yeah. better. Delicious. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tropicalia is kind of their classic brand that we brought. That's a little IPA. Um, I remember a few years ago in Atlanta, that was, man, like you could only get, there were only three places in the city. You could get a Tropicalia keg. And I was like, oh my God, that Tropicalia is amazing. Um, And then I tried the Bebo uh, Pilsner just the other day, which is really badass. But uh, anyway, good group of guys and they're sponsoring our, our event coming up in August 4th and 5th, we're doing the shop party and we're doing the big 20 year celebration at Savoy. Hey, nice. what a, what a segue, Brian, why don't you go ahead and tell us about, uh, the forged by Fuller. Yeah, event. man. So Crack fired up. Sucker up. <clears throat> we're going to have, uh, 15 motorcycles and 10 cars from around the country. So we have a new automotive museum just North of Atlanta called the Savoy. Polished marble floors, beautiful kind of architecture. And so the 4th, <clears throat> August 4th, 2023, you know, if you miss this and it's 30, 30, 34 right now and you're listening, too bad you miss a party. Um, if it takes you that long <clears throat> to get around to listen to a podcast, whatever, you probably don't need to show up to the I don't event know, anyway. man, you never know with this shit. Who knows? Yeah, it lives forever. Like, yeah. okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but if George Barris did a podcast back in 1965 about building the the Batmobile don't and taking think, the Invicta, you know... I, I appreciate the comparison. The Ford Futura <laughs> Don't you think uh, you would have came across car. it a little Wouldn't bit? Wouldn't you be curious well, of, like, you would. Paris? Yeah. I mean, so, like, sometimes it takes a little time to catch up. Like, this morning, uh, I'm just listening to the Colin Noir with Rogan. Yeah. That's probably... Oh, that's a while back. Yeah. You're just now listening to that, huh? Yeah. So sometimes you got to catch up, you know? Yeah. I mean, I just listen to your, you know, some of your podcasts from back you know, quite a few years. You never know when these things go right. around. Yeah, so right. if you're listening to this, so, you miss. I apologize. You, you missed so, the 20 year anniversary, are, and it was awesome. It oh, was. We, awesome. we had a great time. And you guys came. Yeah, we came in. Dude, it was Can't crazy. Remember shit. Right. It's still, <laughs> are we going? Are we? We're going. Are we putting it on we live right yeah, now. We're going. going. We're going. We're yeah, going. They're to going. It. Yep. Oh. And uh, so yeah, man. I'm just the museum pays for shipping. So like the Thundertaker that we built, the Impaler, and the the engraved Shogun, and all these projects from. 20 years of hard work are going to be coming back to Atlanta. They're going to be on display from August through December. And uh, we're going to have a grand opening party with Roadster Shop as a recent sign on Hell today. Yeah. And um, we're going to have Courtney, Chris, and Foos from Overholland are going to come be kind of nice. the, the original hosts. And they decided to come back and help me. And uh, Ian yeah, from Roadster Full Shop, Wheel. kind of the big one. The headliner. Of course. Right. Yeah, of course. Like now, yeah. like, they're getting <laughs> kicked back to, you know, back a notch. Um, and so, yeah, we're, anyway, we're going to have 300 people at the museum for a Saturday night party to celebrate the beginning. and But then Friday night at the shop is going to be a huge throwdown. Nice. And uh, we're really pumped to have, you know, kind of a, Post COVID twenty year celebration, <clears throat> you know, extravaganza. So there's no no masks then. You can still wear <laughs> definitely yours. no mask. Yeah. You can wear yours if you want. I can. Yeah. Right. We get a, we get a teaser on. I what, feel safer uh, wearing my what cars or masks. bikes are going to be there. Fuck those things. I'm sorry. Can we get a teaser on what cars or bikes are going to? Yeah, be there? I mean, we believe. You know, I feel like most of the owners that I've talked to are, are solid. I know the Impaler is coming. I know the Thundertaker is coming. Um, the Haas Museum has three of our motorcycles, including the 2029, which was the big 3D printing. That thing's you know. fucking ridiculous. Y'all guys seen that p- which motorcycle? Is, that? is oh, the this. Ducati Scrambler going to be there? I'm at yeah. Yeah. That's, I saw that. That had to be like five, six years ago. Yep. Yeah. He's def- one that one's definitely there. Bikes that I the I Ducati about. Scrambler? Yeah. I got one of those. Well, this one <laughs> not, is, really. Uh, not really. Not really. Track. <laughs> yeah. We built the uh, frame for the American AMA flat track 
team, David Lloyd and his team. Okay. So we were building, it was, you know, kind of our little first foyer into real racing. Sure. So we got to build the frame for them and we built, you know, kind of a lot of the random fabrication. Nice. But yeah, the 2029 was the first custom motorcycle that had um, extensive use of 3D printing, you know, yeah. by a professional custom bike builder. There were some bikes where they had like a lot of 3D printing, but they were kind of like hodgepodge together yeah. a bit. That is, that's a, that doesn't make sense. It's 150 grand of printing on it. That's a fucking really <laughs> cool piece. <laughs> Look at the bars. I mean, the, those explain bars. The, explain the steering. So the idea was Bobby Haas, who's the owner, who passed away, I believe, about a year and a half ago. So Bobby um, kind of changed. He was the, it's funny now being in a car world to, to talk about this. Um, so Bobby was the poteet of the motorcycle industry. Okay. So he funded probably easily at least 50 you know hundred thousand dollar bikes around the world that were being built to just for the art of it and bobby unlike poti um bobby didn't care whether it really ran or how it you know performed okay. for him it was an art experiment and so bobby really changed the motorcycle industry for quite a few years because he allowed artists to create these kind of like motorcycle pieces of art with the freedom to move away from um, worrying that someone was going to be riding on them for a hundred thousand miles. And um, he pushed his artists. He did a good job, you know, as a good patron would of pushing his artists into the level of um, a higher level of creation than maybe even that artist could believe that they could do. And so he single-handedly kind of changed the motorcycle industry over the last five years. That's a beautiful piece <clears throat> right there. It really is. You talk about like riding them for miles and not that it matters. How many miles do you ride something like that? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, again, you know, that bike was not built. That bike was built for art. Sure. And, you know, Bobby, when you're like, hey, man, what do you, you know, how many, you know, do you need me to run around the block or blah, blah, blah. No, it's going to go in the museum. I Got mean, it. it's just, you know, and I, I don't want to take away from it, but right. that's what he, 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 restri he unleashed the artist part of the motorcycle world and freed us from worrying about, you know, necessarily the practicality of kind of like a Riddler car yeah. would do in the car industry. Can you go so far to then? You can go so far because who fucking you? cares? Nobody's yeah. going to ride it anyway. Right. But you can take the art as high as you want. Just like polishing, you know, like your transmission pan, polishing sure. a oil pan. Like who fucking cares? Like it doesn't, it's not real. You can't drive it. Yeah. I mean, you could, but you'll beat the fuck out of it. So that, yeah. like that front swing arm, I guess I would call it, is that all that, Everything I'm looking at is that 3D printed. That's 3D printed. printed. Yeah. Yep. Titanium and aluminum. Super cool shit. And that's just a, like, turnbuckle for your front. It's called, uh, called hub-centric steering, which is actually very similar to a car. So you have a kingpin, just like you would have in an old Model A flathead axle that goes through the center. And when you first get into it, you're like, what the fuck? Like, how does shit, how does this yeah, hub-centric steering work? Where is it pivoting? Yeah, it's pivoting just in the center of the hub, just like uh, you would have, let's say, you know, you would have a kingpin pivot here. Mm -hmm. You just happen to have two sides of it. Okay. You know what I mean? So it's really, it's very similar to to uh, a kingpin or like a spindle, you know, a spindle on a car. Sure. Once you get it, you're like, oh, yeah, it just seems so complicated. And then all of a sudden, once you figure it out, you're like, oh, yeah, I got it. But um, yeah, those bikes. The the it was it was modeled after the Majestic, which was a twenties French bike that had this kind of full bodied, um, kind of sheet metal look. There it is. See the blue one, or the red one. Sorry. Um, it was modeled after the Majestic, and Bobby was a huge fan of the Majestic, 
and he had had Revival, who does hand built that we're doing this weekend. He had them do this crazy, you know, kind of take on it. And I was like, that's not, that doesn't look like a, a majestic. And, you know, Revival had like completely artistically, you know, twisted it into something else. Yeah, I like yours better. <clears throat> the one on the top, it looks kind of like, uh, like there was a, like a British. English uh, cartoon or something like that. No, there's like a British Northern Hydraulics catalog in like the 60s. That's funny. And they were selling like a mini bike. And that's what you that's got. Funny. It can go over like rocks and things. You Crazy know? French. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's just, it's the minimalistic that's, that's, beauty that's neat. with it. it. It's so fucking cool. I love the mix of, you know, one of the things I love about it. There's a great video on YouTube that we did and we started at the old shop. And we were doing more of the, the fabrication of the body. And that's kind of old school, you know, hundreds of years of, you know, uh, sheet metal fabrication knowledge pushed down. But then you combine it with this modern 3D printing. Bleeding um, edge technology. Yeah, bleeding. And the combination to me is what makes it, like, for me personally, very satisfying. Is It's not just a technology bike. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, there's a lot of old world hand fabbed aluminum in there to go with it. So walk me through the <laughs> shaping process, like on the body. I can tell like, so the rear little fairing I get and like the top profile forward of the seat I get is, have you got like crown throughout the midsection of that? Is there a seam where I see those little bolts? Is it, is it pretty flat? Where, where are the seams? Show me. Yeah, this, uh, seam that I thing? think we I think we seamed it mainly through the top. So there's a weld seam through the top, and then bead rolled, you know, kind of around, um, which is, you know, pretty simple old school technique. We did a hammer form on the swing arm cover that you see kind sure. of on the right. <clears throat> so that was a hammer form, um, and then we we enlisted Nick Pugh, who I worked with at SoCal, it was my one of my first jobs there. Was doing this futuristic Zeno. Uh, X E N O. If you um, you got it on your your pull up right there, so the Zeno was this kind of uh, art center uh, designer phenom who created new edge design back when Cadillac came up with kind of that new edge design. And uh, it was like about the Katera when they came out with the Katera. <laughs> Katera. Katera. No, I think is a short answer. Maybe I maybe I potentially <laughs> maybe I like tried to forget the material. You probably did. Maybe I tried to forget it. It was when Kevin like, tried to have like a Chevy Cavalier, basically. Oh, yeah. Um. Anyways, you know, Nick was a designer and I got to work with at SoCal and that was kind of my first intro into the design world. Uh, it was a car, by the way, sorry, car. It's at the Peterson right now. And uh, so SoCal is like an old school hot rod shop and they're building this futuristic left uh, far left yeah, top left yeah. and they're f building this futuristic car and this and they you know in their opinion nick was just like crazy out of his mind and uh you know it was the future of automobiles at that point right. it was uh propane okay <clears throat> but nobody told him that sucked like at no point you know i mean at the end of the day nick nick's like ultra creative and you know i liked it better in silver i didn't i didn't like it in gold like i, sure. I definitely liked the car and uh in silver if you look left yeah right there go to your your right right a little bit to see the silver sketch that's the sketch that i was commissioned okay. under that's neat and it was better in silver to me um but nick's a great guy and he's fucking Fuck talented as shit and he he digitally he learned on fusion 360 the digital CAD program he learned on the 2029 so like he'd done obviously other modeling programs that's what I was like when I built the body that was what they told me this is what it should look like and I, I liked it better the gold yeah. to me I get lost in gold but yeah, it's whatever. a little polarizing yeah the gold's very polarizing <clears throat> but again you know I mean it's art I mean it's sitting yeah. in the Peterson yeah. Museum I mean you know like somebody Somebody thinks it's, yeah, you know. Sure. You've never seen the Ducati that he did? No. I'd like to see that. Pull the that Nick up. did? Wasn't that you? Oh, I thought you said that Nick did. No, that you did. Oh. 
I was like, I don't know the Ducati that Nick did. <clears throat> no, I followed quite a few of your bikes. That uh, that Vincent yeah, that you did left is there. sick. Oh, that's nasty. That's like the best. Oops. Yeah, there you go. Tracker like stance. Like so that is the uh, we call that pro street bike. Thank yeah. you. It's it's like perfection. Yeah. Thank you. That uh that was and you know what like that's why I, one of the reasons I quit doing production stuff like I've got you know stuff but I've got isn't frames it, to do that and we didn't sell them they didn't sell. Isn't it interesting yeah. how you Ow. when you look at like there's there's <clears throat> guys that do like the craziest custom paint with like airbrushing like to the nines and that simple red and white with a pinstripe it's gorgeous like it's yeah. so fucking it's striking badass. yeah it's didn't sell like it but, should i built one the current customer james who's a badass dude up in new york um he he bought this one got it a great price the original you know kind of uh buyer got it a great deal and uh He's like, dude, this bike should be in a museum. Like, I shouldn't have to ride this thing. I feel guilty. Will you make me kind of a, you know, patinaed version so I can just ride the patinaed version and not feel guilty about it? And I'm like, sure, man. Yeah, awesome. Stoked. So we start building the thing. Well, of course, you know, 10 years later, <laughs> it's double the price that it was back then. And so now, you know, and he's been great. He's been so nice and you know, it's taken longer than we expected. So at the end of the day, like at some point he's like, you know, just make it shiny. It's just taking too long. It's so expensive. Like, <laughs> fuck it. I'll just have two that are shiny and it is what it is. You know. So <clears throat> what your plan when you built that was to build multiples of it? Yeah, we did. Uh, we had the tubes bent and coped and we had the, the brackets were uh, laser cut. So we had a jig, we still have the jig, we have the jig, we have the tubes that are sitting there and we have, you know, um, because my whole thing was like, it's a pro street. Like it is the frame to flip to a couple of the, uh, pics of Johnny riding it, um, on the track. So Johnny was the, he was the racer who actually raced the bike and he jumped on the thing. We did this little photo shoot down in Florida. And I took the thing around the same track. This is his home track. And uh, I took it around the track and I'm like, this is scary as shit. <laughs> like, I mean, it's greasy as hell. It so is. That, that's not you right there. No, hell no. <laughs> and it's greasy. It's my helmet and my clothes. So I had him kind of like, you know, look good for me. <laughs> and I, it's greasy as shit. I mean, I'm terrified. I was like, hell no, you take this thing. And he gets on it. And literally the very first moment that he got on the bike, and he's like, Bruh! like just leaves. And I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> Is that, the, that's a scrambler engine. Yeah. That's uh, like a 900. So if a guy like, let's say a guy's watching this podcast and he sees this bike and he says, I want one of this. What, what is that? It's what is that? Stupid. What does that bike cost? <laughs> how, long so does stupid. It, how long does it take? It's just to get so one? dumb. I mean, like, you know, at the end of the day, that bike ought to be, you know, that bike ought to be 50 grand and it's just yeah. dumb. Like it shouldn't cost 50 grand, but you know what? Like once you go through all the detailing and you buy the shit and you get it done right. and you start going through it, I mean, like it's 40, 50 grand. What do you do on the front stupid. end? That's just, that's just inverted Owens and then cleaned yeah. everything up. Yep. It's dumb. I mean, it's just silly money. You know, it just, it takes so fucking long. But what's Bad your, what's your alternative? You go and buy like a bone stock one for 12 or 15 and then you put some modifications on it. And by the time you're done, you put pipes, you put bars, you do this, you do that. You get it painted. You're like up into the upper 20s, maybe into the 30s. And, and it's just, nowhere near what that yeah. is. And you just get an overpriced yeah. scrambler versus yeah. a piece of art. That is no, right. Yeah, but the thing is, that is the frame that raced against Harley, raced against Indian. Like they raced it. That's top level AMA. Like flat track, that's top level like they literally like is that's off the jig that we built to compete against indian and harley and whatever you know what i mean awesome. that's that I, like you've never seen that bike before no i i, oh, like I, I feel bad that i've never seen that but i i can <clears throat> honestly tell you that's one of the more badass bikes i've ever seen that's that right there to me ranks in like the that's the, that's in the top 10 of bitching thank you custom bikes appreciate built. it 
fucker looks I'll really good. I'll send you good. the jig. You can, like, I'll send you the tubes and the jig. You, can, you guys can <laughs> knock it out. I'm not, I haven't made any while in a while, so, you know, have fun with it. I got the plates and the, I already have I got the, all of it there. I already have the motor. You got the motor. Got the, yeah, yeah, you're good to go. All right. Some money ahead. I'll send you the frame. Look at the bottom left. Like, if you look straight, yeah, one of those ones in white. You see the white? Yeah, that's, shit, we'll just send you one of those. It's not really, you can finish it. You can paint it and wire it and whatever. Sweet. Yeah, you, you get love a paint that. shop though, so we can just have you paint. Or it. we can paint it. Yeah, the plastics are amazing. Like, you know the um, because there's uh, there's a guy I think he's in Michigan. The name slipping me, but man, he just does such a great job at these old flat track uh, and even the modern stuff. I'm sorry, the name is slipping me, but you know they're very inexpensive, very reasonable, and the guy makes a nice quality product. And he literally like you call up and you go, hey, I want those, and you know they show up at your door. You know, they're not even a custom, they're kind of custom, but, you know, flat track guys are getting those. Yeah, I think it's badass. Yeah, it's fun as shit. Damn. So what's coming up next? Oh, shit, man. We've got, uh, we're trying to finish the Tesla swap Cougar that, we, that we've that we done with all of the amenities. And I feel like the comps... The only comps I can think of are like Chip taking the, uh, was that a Corvette that he turned into the imposter? Imposter, like, you know, I'm sure that took that took like six or seven years, and then Troy did the Mercedes where he took like all of the wiring and shit from the Mercedes and turned it into one. Like, we're doing the equivalent of that, and it's motherfucker. It is hard. And I've lost probably a couple employees over it, and we're we're getting close. No, it's going to be good then, right? Yeah, Yeah, I think it's going to be good, and we're getting close to painting upholstery. The customer's been great, and we're we're very close to paint. We got a lot of upholstery done. Got to be great if you're like you're paying somebody to build a cougar, because there's not exactly a lot a lot of guys out there that are like. What inspired the cougar? Yeah, I'm sorry. What inspired the cougar? Um, (laughs) Electric cougar. The photos are incredible. Uh, So. so Bill and his, his buddy, John have pictures of them in high school and, uh, Bill had the Cougar and John had the Z 28, 1979. And so we're building both of them right now. So John got more ass. There was the (laughs) white, (laughs) there was the white Z white Z with the black tux. Okay. And there's the black Cougar with the white tux. Okay. And there's a photo of them back in the day. And so they're, they're both coming back to California with complete, you know, one is, uh, one is, e- um, eco boost or sorry, the eco rod, the GM, you know, uh, California E-Rod, compliant, E rod, E rod compliant, and one is EV. So it's funny that we got both of them and they're both kind of working their way towards paint shop at the exact same time. So that's cool. Yeah. They're going to, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that, man. I mean, on the car side, the things you've built have always been crazy unique. Uh, you, you're not a guy that just, like, slides something out there that's like... <laughs> he marches to the beat of his own drum. Yeah, that's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I think that might have been Fuller, I think, built that for that guy because he's driving it. It's always been something that, like, the Jet Hot 32, the all-wheel Double drive. Double down. That was, one, that was one of the few where, like, there's only a handful of cars out there. Like Mike and Jim built the Pantera. I love the Pantera. So that was kind of like a fuck you. Fuck you guys. Cause I want to build one of those and the all wheel drive 32 roadster. That might've been the only other one where I'm like, ah, fuck this guy. I really want, <laughs> like I really wanted to build. I really want And he finished it. Yeah. And yeah. it's done and it's driving. I'm like, motherfucker. God damn it. Why did, <laughs> why didn't I get that guy? We're, talk like, to us a little that's bit about a cool, that. Project. That was a really cool car. Oh, God. The Grand National, man. I mean, uh, I was thinking the same thing with the Grand National because you have in your showroom right now. Okay. I just saw it for the first sure. time. And I'm like, I had a guy, uh, Jason, who was Ludacris's trainer, who's been teasing me for a Grand National. We drove one and like it never happened. Yeah. And so I've been thinking about Grand National and you guys beat me to the punch. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I got to see it in person for the first time. So that's that's really great. I want to see under the hood. I haven't. I didn't get to see under yeah, the hood well, yet. Uh, we'll Do you probably. think... 
I would be more impressed or Jody would be more impressed building a car for ludicrous. Yeah. I think both of y'all would be can you my hit, wife and Phil. Can you hit it once for me? Share sure. absolute yeah. perfect symmetry in musical taste. And Ludacris would be right up there at the top. 90s, yeah, late 90s rap. Late 90s That's rap. That's awesome. Yeah, my wife and Phil. Well, I, you know, one of my little dreams, you know, is doing this, you know, kind of event at the Savoy is to lure out, you know, reel in the the Ludas. Mm, outcast. You know, yeah. They, like lure in. Like once I feel like we get enough of the guys like you guys and, you know, Foose and some of the folks, then it becomes the Atlanta hot ticket. And, you know, Atlanta's got... You know, in the Hot rap Atlanta. in the rap world, in the hip hop world, like we got some, you know, we got some car guys. Oh, you guys uh, got a killer go Mike, and there. you know, oh, yeah. once Killer Mike says, "Yeah, man, Dude, I'm fucking in." Fucking Killer Mike, Dirt Bike Mike, those motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, they fucking they <laughs> yeah. fuck around with some cars. Luda Outcrat, uh, Luda Outcrat, Outcrast. Oh, I'm fucking losing it. You can see is Outcrast. It, yeah. yeah, it's Outcrast. What's uh? Isn't Rick Ross, Ross in Atlanta? Rick, Rick Ross, Ross is in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Uh, Two chains. I mean, yeah. The other, the other dude. Tyler uh, Perry. Future. Tyler Perry is in Atlanta as well. Isn't Future down there? Because I know the Rings did that uh, blazer. I think it went down there. Oh yeah. I don't. I don't know. That's like twenty years <clears> past <throat> my. Right, that, yeah, that gets too later, new. Right. That's too not, new. Anyway, anyway the point anyway. being, like, <laughs> uh, it's no I hope that our, you know, that that ticket becomes, you know, one where, <clears> you know, those guys start to realize like how many badass car guys from around yeah. the country are kind of like working their way in to see it that they've got to come and so that'll be fun that'd be cool sure. um but yeah the double down was the inspiration for the thing was originally there's a uh one of the movie car um kind of producers who did Smokey and the Bandit <clears throat> in Atlanta when that whole thing was filmed down there I went to his house and he had this cannonball run 32 Ford that was sitting there with wide five wheels on it okay. and it was bare metal. And this guy was hilarious. I mean, he had a 1932 Cabriolet that was sitting um, on a bench and sitting there and, and he wouldn't finish the car and he would just throw the tools down and be like, fuck it, I'm done. And then he would move to the next car and then buy more tools and then start the next car. And so, but he wouldn't sell anything. He didn't need to. And so he had this kind of uh, NASCAR cannonball run car that he built that was going to be, you know, kind of a thing. Had a Franklin quick changer in wide five, but he never finished it. And I tried to buy it from him. He's like, nah. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to make it car inspired by this so i had leftover brookville you know body panels when i got stuck in you know ohio for snowpocalypse in atlanta that time and um i had the wide five wheels i had all the pieces set up and then i met uh gordon who was one of the jet hot owners at that point and gordon's kind of like one of the you know he'd been around he's not quite poteet level but he had done a lot of builds over the years and great guy, fucking hilarious. And he goes, all right, man, well, what do you think? We had lunch and Cheryl was there, his daughter, who's awesome. And uh, and I said, yeah, man, I got this thing. And then, no joke, I've never had this happen in my life. But there was this vision and I watched it like move across like above me. It was this very strange like moment. And I was like, and maybe it should be all wheel drive. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I mean, literally, I'm not fucking exaggerating. Okay. It's this vision. And it's just like <laughs> across my brain. And I was like, and maybe it ought to be all wheel drive. And him and Curly, like, oh shit, man, we were just talking about we need to do an all wheel drive. Like, I can't believe you just pulled that shit out of nowhere. Like, we're all in. Like, and they were in. It was like it. Like, they were in. And he's like, <laughs> fucking awesome. And I was like, okay. So, so we did 1,000 horse natural no blower all-wheel drive quick change popping out of the front like an old a camera blower thing. yep yeah. quick well, no, change no. sticking uh, through boss. the grill shell oh boss, boss. okay Kazi boss and then kurt Herb, kurt um you know kurt like tuned the thing to perfection i mean that thing like when it came out of the exhaust it was so perfect did you drive it i drove it dude and it's like crack 
Like you want to leave your family. <laughs> and just drive that. Fuck the house. <laughs> fuck the family. <laughs> you know, seriously, dude, like the most car crack, Wes, uh, who drove it to, who's my mechanic of the shop we were talking about the double downs we or something he's like do i get to drive it to the museum and i was like fuck you no man fuck you <clears throat> like it's like who has it now uh it's a, a guy in flagstaff who bought it from the auction back at barrett years ago a rumor is he uh was a lottery winner but i don't hmm. i don't it's on it's been on forza twice they called me recently like hey we're gonna put it on forza i was like it's already on forza <laughs> Put it like, on there. We want to do it do again. It again. So I think that's going to be a stipulation before we can come down to the event is that I get to drive it. Maybe you can. I'll just see if you can break it. No. I just want I'm to just trying it. to get the thing there. I haven't called the guy yet. I'm waiting to like make sure I got all my stuff wrangled. Dude, I, don't, I, like, I hate to be like the super tech guy. But you, know, you want but, to know. Right. So I want to know. You've got, okay, you've got a quick change center section that's obviously centered in the front grill chill. Yep. And you have a transmission that goes behind the engine. And you have an oil pan. And there's an oil, like, so and obviously accessory drive. the drive shaft doesn't go directly through the center of the engine because that's where the crank shaft goes. So how did you connect? What's so the drive? We took Give a, me the drive line. How did the drive line work? Real good okay. U-joints. Yeah. <laughs> so we took a, uh, we did a Denali transfer case, 1,000 pounds capable. Um, it's a, basically a multi-link chain. Pretty similar to a motorcycle, you know, primary case, you know, okay. transfer case. It's like 4L60. Uh, we did a... 80 uh, before eight. 80, right? Denali? Um, or a 6? The Denali transfer case, I'm sorry, I don't remember, you know, exactly which one that was. So it's an auto. But the transfer case, but then the, the it had a four-speed, just gnarly, like, you know fucking gnarly box i okay. mean this thing was not you know anything okay so you just had the transfer case connected yeah the transfer case was denali manual box manual box four speed gotcha. fuck i can't remember what that thing was right now and uh but when we came to the front then it, we basically what we did was kick over we did a custom transfer case to kick back over to the center in order to grab the quick change very same process, multi-link chain. Pretty much, we just mimic the transfer case in the front in order to kick with just no gear reduction. It's which just yeah, a yep, offset. one to one. So like you just do the U, you around the engine basically. Yep, yep, exactly. And it's like a one gear. We had a custom gear made by uh, Motor Gear Works in Atlanta, which is a great little company. You know, it was like one gear was twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah, to to make the to make it adapt to the quick change in order to get around to the side of the big block. But yeah, dude, that motherfucker just, I mean, that thing, when you drive it, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, it's so, does it hook? It hooks like a, it, it's basically, I feel like it would just go sideways. No, no. It it's sh like, shoots like a missile. Yeah. It shoots like a missile. Like imagine if you were driving a, what I always tell people is imagine like a track, like a tank, but you had NASCAR, NASCAR <laughs> slicks instead of fucking On tennis the tracks. Track. And so all power is just straight, like, <laughs> 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 like fucking. But, but yeah, the shifting was, the shifting was complete, you know, like Shit. perfection, man clutch, you know, like nothing soft, like fucking yeah. man clutch it. But then you put it in and rocks are just flying everywhere because the, the NASCAR slicks are just Sticky picking up rocks, yeah. throwing them into the fucking air. Um, so it's this really strange combination of familiarity and openness because you're not, you, you know, you can see everything. Yeah. Right. You're, it's a 32 Ford. So you're completely in a place that you know, you feel comfortable and you're good. But at the same time, so like, cool. I mean, I don't think I got past, like, I really, like, legitimately, I don't think I, I, I didn't drive it a lot, but I don't think I got past 40% throttle, and I was fucking terrified. That's 40, 50% awesome. throttle was scary as fuck. <laughs> just I'm like, like, I want more. Give me more. Just looking at the pictures, it's just, like, a clear indication of, like, you were just, like, Fuck it, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, like you look at the interior cage, like the door bars. Anybody else would be like, "Hey, you can't do that." Like, nah, we can't. Like, how are we gonna like brace it? That's a lot of power. You're like, no, oh, fuck it. 
We'll just put straight door bars through the right through the doors. Well, Fuck NASCAR. the doors. It's yeah. very NASCAR. Yeah. yeah. That's what NASCAR hazard. does. Yeah. yeah. Going over the doors. That, that was a cool car, man. I, I Thank you. really, really, really like that. Yeah, car. that's that's definitely one of our best. The owner yeah. pushed me hard too. Like he pushed me. Like I was like, it's a 32 Ford. It's fucking all wheel drive. It's a thousand horsepower. What else do you fucking want? Like you want me to do more? And he's like, you got more in you. I'm like, <laughs> fuck. What do you mean I got more in me? And he was right, you know. And I called uh, Nick Garfius, who's a designer. He's been around Oakley, and he's been around. Uh, he he was at Mercedes Design, but he's uh, very talented. And I called him up. And I was like, dude, like. This guy wants me to do more. I'm like, it's a 32 fucking thousand horse all wheel drive 32 and he wants more. And I was like, can you come help me? And so he came over for two days and we cardboarded and sketched and, you know, between the two of us. How many hand bucked rivets are in that thing? Shit, I don't know. A fucking shit ton? Yeah. Have you done any since? Oh, yeah. I love rivets. (laughs) Yeah, I love rivets. Not much paint. Didn't work out. Paint bill was very cheap. Yeah, minimal. <laughs> that, that. Is that a rail can on the side or what? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. A little trim yeah, black. The, the things. Damn, trim really black cool. goes a long way. Yeah, that it? nose. I love that nose. Fuck, I love that nose. Yeah, that thing just looks yeah. like. Yeah. Angry. Yeah. It's so just angry. bowed up like a bull. And it drives like, like it looks. Dude, come on. Like, why can't we make. Fuck, your roadster shop. Like, build a fucking chassis where you just bolt some shit in and you got that. Dude, I we, mean, come on. The problem is, is that I don't get that guy who's like, I think you got more in you. They're like, no, that's I think, enough. They're, honestly, they're usually I, like, I think that's y'all an- are onto something on the supercar thing. They're like, that's enough. Do the super, you're going to do the supercar body. We're going to do the all wheel drive chassis. I mean, I think dude, Josh is just fucking those around. are going to fly off the shelf. Well, this body's already here. I mean, it's I'm not the end of the day, flying off the we shelf. We produce dude, some of these. Three or four a year. Yeah, we need huh? to have well, five yes. built. Okay. We need yes. to have five built just because right. we're ready. Get him like Koenigsegg level. Yeah. Yeah. Or Koenigsegg pricing level. You're telling me that a supercar. With a quick change front with, end. Well, I mean, I will like. Right. If it doesn't, it, like as if it doesn't make enough noise in the back, put the motherfucker in front too. Like put one in front of yeah, you. You got to have dual quick joint. Right. Quick well, change well, noise. Let's thing, run like, straight cut gears. You wouldn't really have to, if you guys would put this in production, you know, the body obviously is Brookville. There's a lot of this shit's already sure. in production. You wouldn't really have to put that much in production in order to make that car. It's kind of like, hey, you want to buy an all-wheel drive, you know, jet hot car, you know, kind of chassis, and you you put it together how the fuck you want. How many there's, guys out there do you think can handle much. it, though? Not many, but me and you want one. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's... The three of us want oh, one. Oh, yeah. That, isn't that enough? Oh, oh yeah. We do. I think that's underestimated how fucking cool that is. Like, that's a quick change housing. Yeah, in the front. Sticking through a 32 yeah. Ford grill shell in the yeah. front. Yeah, and you guys could make, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you guys, what's left? There's not that much. I mean, nothing more than you guys do all the fucking time. I mean, you can make that shit, you know, in your sleep. I mean, it really is not that much more to do to make that a, an available, like, yeah, you can have an all-wheel drive deuce. Make it like that if you want, you know? I mean, that would be badass. Why not? Dude, if anybody's listening to this, I would like to apologize to the sales guys right now. Well, Lord, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. No, we, you just t- go ahead and take the deposits, Phil. <laughs> just take those deposits. <laughs> well, Brian, it's been awesome. We've reached the point in the podcast where we start re- asking some of these standard questions that we ask every single guest. So, first up, best piece of advice that you've ever received? Oh, geez. Oh, damn. Wow. That's rough. I mean, the, I guess the biggest advice that I would give somebody is today is that life is short, chase your dreams, chase your passions, and, um, you know, make the most of this little life that you have. Best car movie and why? Uh, just right off the top, I love Cobra. Oh, Ooh. My you know, yeah, you, you, you got know. yourself a best friend now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, <laughs> we're, we're connecting. Like, this, is, this is a crazy dynamic. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, love Cobra. Oh, Marion Cabretti. Yeah. Ugh. Damn it. I haven't That's... watched that in a while. I got to show my son that. Glad you reminded yeah. me. Cobra's a good movie. Yep. Yeah. Uh, your very first car 
and a story about that car. My first car was a uh, 1930 Model A. Um, chop top and I did at some point I put four people in it which I thought was pretty wow. impressive Model A small people four yeah. small people Model so A you, you and three small people <laughs> that, you got a rumble seat all of that? the opposite sex alright there you go I was going to add three <laughs> chicks I put, or what? I put 14 people in my S10 Blazer I could see the S10 Blazer before I could see three extra people in the yeah. Model A yeah that was a good day I guess chicks. shout out to Jana. So three, so three wide Liz. and one one sitting on a lap on a lap. I mean, yeah. you, know, you, you envision it. You envision it however you want. Uh, it was high school. Uh, Auga. What's in your pocket right now? Well, I took everything out because I wanted to really be focused on this podcast. <laughs> okay. So there's literally zero. Zero. And yeah. You flew too. So we'll, yeah, but we'll, I just literally like, yeah. I mean, we'll cut, I we'll pulled cut, it all out and there's we'll nothing. Cut that out. Bef- before we go, Stream once it. more, tell everybody about Forged by Fuller. It's August 5th, right? 5th and 6th. August 4th and 5th in Atlanta, Georgia, 2023. Going to be a big party, so check it out. Make sure you, uh, you try to make it. <clears throat> and if you don't, unlike these guys, you're going to miss out. Is it's going to be an awesome invitation time. invitation only or is this like open? This is... This one's going to be the part. The shop party is pretty much an, an open deal. The um, the museum gig is going to be limited. Um, you got to it's going to be VIP, on VIP, right? You got to yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be on display from August through December. So there mm. will be a the whole event. You know, like showing the vehicles will be on for a long for four months. That's kick ass. But the party is exclusive. So, yeah, thanks for having me on, y'all. That was really fun. Dude, this was great. Fun. This awesome. is a great time. Yeah. We honestly got to do this again. It's I, been a, it, I feel like we drank <clears throat> more than we talked, and we there's so much more to dig oh, into. Oh, we drank a lot. You know, I, I got to tell you, I don't know these dudes. You know, you brought all this beer. I'm not, this is, I am not a beer guy at all, and is, I generally strongly dislike microbreweries beers. <laughs> <laughs> and this is... This is really good. Yeah, they make. I'm they're drinking, solid. Uh, Mine, this one's this good. was good. Uh, Athena Berliner Weiss, which, uh, man, that is. This yeah. gives you off. just solid. enough hats off that to those guys. Weirdness yeah. that, but it's not off putting. Yep, mm. they're solid. Yeah, right, that's a great yeah. sales pitch. Thank for you, it. <laughs> thank you, Greet Your Comforts. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, appreciate you guys. Thanks, dude. Thanks, thanks, thanks again to Brian awesome. Fuller. Remember, you can keep up with Brian by following along on Instagram at Fuller Moto. Thanks again for listening to Oil and Whiskey and Ironclad Original. If you like the show, be sure to leave a rating review. Check out our brand new YouTube page at Oil and Whiskey. It's got all the episodes new and old. Smash that like button. Thanks again to Brian Fuller. We'll see you again next week. (laughs) 